Okay, uh, welcome to those who are in the room, welcome those who are remote, uh, welcome especially to our previous four seminar presenters on Muslims and Dialogue, Jews and Dialogue, Humanists and Dialogue, and Christians and Dialogue. Um, we have, as has been pointed out, a very packed and tight, probably over packed, for which I have to accept responsibility and apologize, um, but the attempt was to try to give all four speakers, uh, in a sense, the opportunity to engage with each other's presentation, um, and also not to shut out the rest of the participants. Um, in the attempt to do all that, it's probably too tight with only a half hour break in the afternoon. So I have to apologize for that. It's difficult to readjust it at this stage, otherwise different people will be doing different things and that will be unbalanced as well. So I have to uh, crave your indulgence and um, also ask your forgiveness when I might be brutal in cutting across any one of you um, at the end of your kind of timetable slots. Um, for those of you remote and in the room who may wish to refresh yourselves at a future point um, of the actual presentations to which um, each other are responding here, uh, those are now all available on the OCRC YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to um, do that in a refreshing way um, after today. But we begin um, by uh, responses, first of all, to Saria, who's on my right here, just I think you can see on the screen. Saria Cheraval Contractors um, presentation on Muslim and Dialogue um, from the other three uh, presenters. And then she will respond to that, and then we'll have um, open discussion arising from that. So we begin uh, by Jeremy um, making his response. Thanks very much. Uh, I would apologize in advance because I'm going to read what I'm going to say in the hope that I might even keep roughly to time. Um, so th there's a lot to agree with what Sarah is saying, particularly from my point of view, obviously, inclusive to the yeah. non religious, in his, this case, through into conviction terminology uh, uh, and recognition of the complexity and diversity of lived religion. Um, into the three spaces uh, for inclusivity in dialogue, you effectively define three types of diversity. The first thing is about the non-religious. You rightly say that, the, that this category consists of those who have a conviction about their non-religious ideas, and those who are simply not religious not committed to any particular non-religious stance, or but who are convinced that they're non-religious. Um, however, perhaps it's worth pointing out that everybody, I think, including those in the some don't care category, which certainly exists, uh, does have a worldview. And every everybody has values, even as those are poorly defined and inconsistent. The question is, you know, do we have a label? For it? Second in the category was the religious one. And in discussing them, you say uh, that some Muslims have strong religious commitments and religious considerations on the forefront of decisions they make in their lives, for others, Islam may be only a matter of cultural identity. Um, and it's peripheral. And obviously, that's true, um, and, and particularly important when you're talking about religion. In the context of dialogue, perhaps it's also important to recognize that this very religious versus largely cultural dimension. It's not the only one that non Muslims engaging in what we need to be aware of. Theological differences can be very important. For example, the current Lady of Heaven dispute or views on the female. The British Islam presents a challenge for non Muslims because of its complexity and absence of structure. No one, as far as I can see, is truly representative. And unfortunately, it's the hard line activists who like to present their version. As a moment, that's a problem. 
In that context, one thing I missed from the paper was discussion on the engagement of mainstream Muslims in dialogue activity. Given the undoubted problem of anti Muslim prejudice, it would seem from the outside that opportunities for dialogue, um, personal contact, and humanization of the other would be strongly welcomed and promoted by innocents everywhere. But my personal experience is that that's the best, the best patch. It would be interesting to understand uh, why that is. And the third category you go to are people, individuals, and group convictions which have don't have any connection with religion or non religion. Um, and these could be commitments to global challenges, climate change. And what's exciting about this is the third space is that these commitments are often shared across religions and beliefs. Uh, indeed, a, a Muslim and a Jew or a humanist may find themselves holding the same banner in March about climate change and have a fruitful interaction as a result. And that, but this often happens in much more mundane contexts, such as the workplace or school or the school gate. These informal encounters are important and are a form of dialogue around. I don't think we should stretch the interconvictional definition too far. Interactions between non religious Liverpool and Everton supporters certainly feature, quote, firmly held beliefs and opinions, but I don't think that's what we're talking about here. To me, religion or belief, the terminology used in the uh, uh, and defined in the Equality Act, is the common thread coming through everything we're discussing. Whether we call it into conviction or into faith, or as we do simply dialogue. Um, I obviously welcome your sentiment that Muslims should support dialogue, and I know you don't want to get into theological discussions. Obviously, I wasn't wholly convinced by the Islamic theological basis for dialogue, um, which features piety as a prerequisite for equal respect, which obviously is a bit uncomfortable for the non religious. But I guess this is an example where the most important thing for non-Muslims is the fact that Muslims who can see the benefits of constructive dialogue are able to find justifications for doing so by interpreting their texts through the lens of benign intent rather than literate. When you come back to the sociological perspective, it was interesting and welcome that you highlighted shared values and referred to all religions and non-religions orientations as living traditions, which comes close to my human constructs, though I know you don't quite go that far. I really like your analysis of lived everyday religion and non religion, in particular, its reference to the messiness of everyday life. In a way, and I, people, and I think we all have personal inclinations, such as the desire to protect the environment, and then what they fit with our religious or non religious. Another way around. I would, of course, see this as another example. Of the human creative process of work, with ideas of right and wrong arising from our shared needs as thinking social animals rather than an external source. We highlight a feature of this messiness is personal autonomy and the people, quote, confront a religious identity which may at times differ from the official doctrine. But also that there are actually in this country two gay Muslim organizations. Um, I think it may be worth pointing out that the ability to exercise that, be it on that we live in a plural, largely liberal, and largely secular society in which freedom of religion is protected. This has become the norm in academic practice for the everyday to be used in, in uh, to similarly denote liberal forms of Islam. That was new to me and interesting as was your refutation, as I understood it. But unlike Christianity, even the Quran. Turning finally to the case studies, to me, the first two, which was sharing the Muslim women's stories with non-Muslims and the impact of Muslim and non-Muslim students interacting on campus, were both examples of the value of contact with the other as a means of humanization, challenging stereotypes. And maybe the is halal a recipe for cooking chicken example suggests that we've got a, another issue with basic education on religion and worldviews. I'm sure that the third case study, training social workers dealing with Muslim heritage children in the care system, is primarily an example of dialogue, but I can see that informally it led to dialogue among participants. Through the paper, is the important issue of multiple dimensions of identity. Engineering students were an obvious example, as were the campaigners, but of course, so is the author. 
as a Muslim, I don't know, I don't know, uh, who's also a, a British. In the diverse reality of the, the interconviction approach. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you for your discipline, um, the, the timing. And I know Saria has been taking notes here um, of points you've been making, which she will no doubt come back in her response and the wider discussion. So, we move now then to Emeritus Professor Michael Taylor's um, response. <laughs> Muslim and much. I have not out my response, so it may be a bit more less precise. Um, but I did feel very much in sympathy with the paper and sort of at home with it. Um, as you've read mine, you'll probably guess to some extent why. Um, and I go along with Jeremy that I like, I really don't think I'd come across it before, the phrase interconviction. Um, I think I talked about interfaith and, you know, and interwork and so on, but interconviction, I think, is a, is a very helpful terminology, very inclusive. And what it does, of course, is to underline that all participants in dialogue, whether they call themselves of a faith, whether it's interreligious, whether it's not, and as has been said, they all actually have convictions. Uh, they are all in the end forced back at certain points to say, well, this is what I'm convinced about, this is what I, I believe. And I think that puts us all on a much more level playing field when it comes to dialogue. Uh, we could come back a bit again to that in relation to Jeremy's paper. Um, secondly, I like the way you painted the background and told us where you were coming from, which only provokes me to want to be clear where I'm coming from and where I get interested, which is not a value judgment. Um, other people, you know, come to life uh, in different aspects of the dialogue. I come to life when uh, I want to see how it relates to us sharing common human issues. Um, whether they are of the relative, um, not superficial, but day by day examples or deep social issues and social policy and justice issues, all of which you refer to. Um, question that I've got there, um, apart from I noticed that you refer to the lesser heard voices, which does raise again the issue of power, uh, which probably we need to discuss a bit more than it is discussed in the papers. Um, but you paint a picture, you know, you, you like me, like um, dialogue, where it kind of comes to life within the relationships that we already have, because we live together, we study together, we work together, we're in the same community and so on. So I think we're on a common kind of ground there. What I also think is it's, it's not just the place where because we're together, some interesting conversations occur, you know, about one another's faith and one another's lives. Um, but is it also where we actually discover whether talking about one another's faith is actually relevant? I mean, one of the um, outstanding features of your case studies, at least two of them to me, and one in particular, was that when these women started to talk, you know, uh, against perhaps the prejudice view that, that Islam is very much not doing women many favours, let's put it that way. But the, when they started to talk about it, they didn't actually talk about faith at all. So I wonder, you know, I'm interested both that that's the best way in which we, that's the best context in which to talk about our faiths. But how does it push back? And when we do talk about them, begin, as it were, to influence and inform the attitudes and policies that we construct. So I very much value your comments. Do we discover very often that it isn't actually very important to talk about faith? That's quite stark in one case study. Uh, whereas if you think of uh, present discussions in Afghanistan, it seems to be very, very important. And secondly, how far you see, once you get into a dialogue about faith, how far that begins to inform 
you know, the commonalities of issues that you come from and within which you start to talk. Um, the third thing that I put down was um, that I need to learn a lot more. I think I know a bit about the Christian approach to what we might call sacred texts, but I think I need to learn a lot more about the Muslim approach to sacred texts. Um, if I'm honest, some of the ones that you quote, and this exact parallels with Christians, this isn't kind of, you know, one's better than the other here. We all have the same problem. But some of them that you quote and, and talk about, they seem to me to be very porous, sometimes very tenuous bases on which to um, construct convictions or attitudes or approaches, if you know what I mean. Um, so I wondered if you could comment on where do you see the boundaries are to interpretation? You know, where does it no longer become a, as it were, legitimate interpretation? Or are we simply thrown back on the boundaries where we can find some measure of agreement? Um, or is there something authoritative there that uh, is a kind of red line that you can't cross? Um, and the last thing that I, I wanted to raise was um, your references to contextual beliefs, which I think is a lot similar to what I talk about in terms of, um, you know, faith in context and beliefs in context and so on and so forth. Um, it's a question, really. Um, that, am I right that you also... beliefs that they may have longevity and in that sense they can survive through changes you know they may have longevity but that all our beliefs or our convictions are liable because they are relative not in a bad sense but in a serious sense they're relative to the context in which they get made and held and the context change the beliefs are likely to change as well and as i put in my paper i mean there are huge examples in christian history where Christians have completely changed their views. And if you ask why, I mean, some of course would say, oh, we had a, a you know, new understanding of the spirit, they would dress. So that's the other question I would ask. Do you agree that in the end, all such uh, convictions are contextual in that sense or contingent in that sense? Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, as you can see, we're accumulating now a series of questions, some overlaps, some distinctive ones, and that will be our experience, I guess, as we go through the day and also across the papers. Uh, but we come now to uh, Rabbi Jackie Tadix. Uh, Listening and having read your papers, I was struck by the really conscious that in many, many ways I'm the odd one out. I mean, I'm not a professor. I'm not into the academic world. I'm only a pretend professor. Oh, that's okay. But listening to you, you know, I, I'm a, a rabbi. I, uh, I'm a teacher, uh, and I have an academic background in Jewish studies. Um, but that doesn't take me into the realms that you are delving. In fact. As you noticed in my paper, I took a wholly different approach to the whole thing. Um, but that didn't mean, of course, that I don't appreciate what we have written, because I did. Um, I enjoyed reading it. I enjoyed learning new sociological terms that will help me <laughs> understand what's going on in life. And, and that was, in, and I really am grateful for that. Um, it also made me incredibly aware of the lacuna in my paper of not talking about the, um, the value of, of joint projects, because I actually took it theologically, maybe that's my uh -huh. but you know, I took it theologically rather than sociologically. And of course, within the Jewish world, there are 
and you know, many, many projects that we do with other religions. And of course we get involved in that way. But it didn't occur to me to put that under the title dialogue. And I think what my question is really is what do we mean, very basic question, by dialogue? You know, what is dialogue? Is it just sitting down having a cup of tea together, um, which is very, very beneficial in its way? Or is it trying to deal with questions in our own faiths which are very dark sometimes and very problematic? Um, and the, how these influence our contact with other religions. So, you know, when I was reading your paper, I was conscious of the of that lack of theology there. And the big question, of course, um, which comes to Christianity, which you named uh, the triumphalism um, that is present, I believe, in Islam, in wanting. Um, people to convert to Islam, um, you know, and, and how that influences dialogue. Um, how does one cope, uh, and these are the same questions that I would ask you, I'm afraid, um, from, you know, from the Christian point of view, um, how does one cope with the relativism that they may bring to one's own religious beliefs? Uh, and how, you know, it's all very well um, in this wonderful secular society, and I agree with you, it's a wonderful secular society. It gives us a lot of freedom. Um, but how do we deal in other societies where that freedom is not there? Um, and how do we deal with the, the darkness in our own religious beliefs, which is present? So that for me is a huge, huge question. Um, and um, in terms of the of the of the of the generosity in your paper, of, I, I actually found the business of, of the social workers having to learn um, about Islam actually very meaningful for dialogue, strangely enough, um, because you know they have to interact with these children, and I think of um, uh, people in Ravenswood, uh, which is a village for Jewish children. That there are, in fact, many children of all different groups there, but the people who run the houses generally are not Jewish, mm -hmm. and they have to learn about Judaism to run the houses in a Jewish manner. Mm -hmm. um, and that, to me, has been a, an incredible form of, of interfaith dialogue, mm -hmm. of learning about each other. Mm -hmm. so, so my question for you really is, um, world, the sociological world, where you are doing some amazing tasks, um, is that actually fundamentally altering the prejudicial views that many of us, many of us in our religious groups hold against others? How do we deal with that? <laughs> so, thank you very much, uh, Jackie. And, and there we have quite an agenda. Um, Paul, uh, can I just ask you to clarify for me? Um, I think you asked a question earlier on about how do we deal with the kind of relativism, mm -hmm. right? And and but then you went on to something else, and I was thinking, what it, you said it's all one issue. Can you just clarify what the one issue was? Down, I've got to remember. Do you think it's mainly about if we if we're acknowledging contingency and relevance, how do we deal with that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, how do we deal with the, you know, basically, if, if, if I accept the relevance of uh, humanism or Christianity or, or Islam um, and want to celebrate those differences, which I do, then how do I explain that I actually feel Judaism is best for Jews? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we've had a number of disavowals uh, from our speakers, but 
of course, one of the great joys of, as well as responsibilities in organizing a series like this is that one is able to, insofar as they agree to do it, uh, select people who one thinks will make a very important and good contribution to this debate. And that's precisely why all of you are here, uh, because I know you will be asking and um, engaging in a way that's challenging uh, to each other out of experience as well as out of reflection. So we give the floor now to Saria uh, to try to make some response. Um, thinking on your feet, I know, yes, but yes. nevertheless, these are the questions that are coming up and we look forward to hearing uh, your initial response to that before we widen out the discussion. Thank you, Paul, and, and thank you all for not sort of ripping it apart and, and you know, shredding it to bits and, and all of that. So, so thank you very much for being kind to me, firstly. Um, right, so what should, where should I start? Okay, I'd like to start with a little story. So a long time ago, when I was Paul Weller's postdoc, he was running the Religion, Belief, Discrimination, Equality project that looked at into religious interbelief relations in the UK. I I feel work, and, and one of the stories stands out to me. Um, it was a city up north, a town up north, and there was some sort of interfaith event, and um, there were representatives of the local cathedral, but also representatives of the local interfaith body. No Muslims on that group incident event, you know, during that week. And they had a stall in the city center, and they sold things you know, raising money for charity. And they said to me every day that there was this elderly Muslim gentleman who would come. And so these were things that we were sort of selling for, for charity. We were trying to raise money for interfaith dialogue activities and for underprivileged children. But this elderly Muslim gentleman would come and he would haggle with a second-hand teacup for two pounds and he wanted it for 50 p, you know, so on and so I tell they were Everybody was a little grumpy that we come every single day and try and get the deal of the century. And they do a little bit of exchange, you know, because they were Christian, he was Muslim, not really anything. And then on the last day of the, um, the, the stall, again, the elderly gentleman comes, he haggles his way, gets another cut price. I don't know, maybe a glass tumbler or something. And then he goes away. Half an hour later, Notice he's coming back and everybody sort of prepped. Yeah, the last deal of the century. But instead, he comes and he gives everybody an orange that he's probably got again at price from a marketing stall. Um, you wonder why I'm telling you this story because the lady who told me this story, who was a local, you know, she, she was pastor of the local church, and she just tells me that suddenly what to reality how we come from different identities, different cultural backgrounds, this elderly gentleman, perhaps first generation migrant from Pakistan, who came from traditions where had, you know, where they yeah, arguing about the price of things or something that was a done deal. But when he bought the oranges back, he bought them a return gift. She was overwhelmed by a feeling of, you know, finally recognizing his generosity. A generosity that she said is theologically grounded in both Christianity. Really simple act, you know, the grumpiness they had about having to sell various items at 70% discount. You know, it, it removed all of that. And suddenly the common humanity, the, the shared values of both, you know, cultures came to the fore for her. Um, and that kind of summarizes for me some of the discussions that we, we've sort of been discussing today. Um, you know, Jeremy says we've got a lot to agree, and he really <coughs> writes intercondictional dialogue, as did Michael like that. Um, did you? <laughs> no, that, that wasn't a creation of mine at all. I think Paul had that at the top of his, you know, the title <coughs> for his um, series. I have also engaged with the idea of interconviction and dialogue for a long time. I mean, I've wondered how do we include different worldviews? How do we include worldviews that are not religious and, and you know that are absolutely relevant to the table, you know, to the dialogue? Um, but how do we understand that belief, you know, whether non-religious or religious belief can mean so many different things to so many people? And that's where you know interconvictional 
you know, comes to me, drawing on you know, people like Vera and Nagel who have written about this, reflecting on, on European contexts. Um, so A, there is the sociological devaluing of, of religious identity, religious values in the secular project. I mean, 50 years ago, we thought that the sociologists thought religion was going to disappear. It hasn't, it has changed significantly. In this country, the, the demographics of religion are very different, but religion is certainly here. And, and I think interconvictional allows us also to recognize that these identities, these values are not just something that are, you know, divinely ordained or, or fairy tales that are, you know, held as, as true by certain people. These are also values that they lead their lives by. Um, and, and that define their interactions with the wider society. So that is really why I like the term interconviction. It, it isn't without critique. I mean, there are people who say convictions are you know, too fuzzy a term. We cannot really refer to religion because religion has these things and ways of doing things. Are there a little headscarf or are there the technicolors? I think that, that will help address Michael's uh, ideas of contextual approaches, but, but staying with, with conviction for now. Um, there are critiques of the term, but I think there are also that, that, you know, there are critiques that we need to acknowledge and engage with, but there are all, there is also this value, and, and so I stand by the term. Uh, right, where should I go next? Football is a new religion. I've looked it up on Google, it is a new religion. So, um, <laughs> shake Google. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> call him Rabbi. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe Google is the ultimate internet leader. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, you heard it here first. <laughs> um, <laughs> I should stop giggling now. I'm going to try and do this. As, as did Jackie, how do we challenge, how do we address the relativism that can creep into interfaith dialogue? You know, when we're not trying to convert people, I think we have all of you in this room, by the way, by the end. But how, how is it our religious diversity? The tensions uh, within our faith towards you know, each other. How do we deal with that when also in entering into the space of mutual dialogue? Um, in addressing that, I'm starting to think about, um, you know, European interest in, in Islamic studies, in, in Islam as it emerged as a social political movement. The reason I can, I'm thinking about this is because I wrote a paper last night about it, and so I can think about this, but talk about in relation to the study of Islam. Interest in, in Islam, but a few Christian interest in Islam is probably as old as Islam as Islam itself. Um, however, this, this interest wasn't marked, wasn't colored by the neutral sort of or, or the curi or, or curi you know curiosity level. You know, a political, uh, a polemical underpinning to understand Islam in order to a and so that we can't get away from that Muslim engaging. You know, there, there are Muslims engaging in multicultural society as theologians, but there are also Muslims, you know, engaging, um, you know, with, with evangelical mindset. There is, uh, there is that. And one way I I like to move away from it is, is by drawing upon John Dewey, the, the, the pragmatist thinker, that experience is central and as, as relevant to individual meaning the individual makings of meaning, but at the same time, 
it allows a space for, for diversity to, to coexist. Um, I don't think the zeal to you know, convert people anytime soon. Essentially, you know, Christianity, Islam, the let's say, religions. Um, Okay. I think living in multicultural plural society, there is a commitment among each, you know, the constituting members to understand the truth, to understand diversity in so far as to draw boundaries around their own identity positions. So I'm wrapping there now. Thank you, Paul. Uh, um, yeah, around lived religion. Um, I, that is important. I think my emphasis on, on lived religion is, is not, does not the significance of texts. It does not diminish the significance of institutions. But what it does do is foreground how everyday ordinary people navigate all of these structures. You know, so if you are a Muslim who wants to wear a top um, like I do, how do you do it? Do you stick, you know, do you stick to traditional, often patriarchal structures of, of modesty? Do you find your own ways around? Do you articulate your sense of personality and agency within your network of which are? And this is just one really common thing. It's more, you know, careful and, and not, you know, there are a number of other examples that require careful and nuanced thinking. I am, thinking about that same gentleman whose story I told you at the start. And he did try to get, you know, cut price cups, but he did find, feel, uh, uh, I don't know whether it was a theological commitment or a cultural commitment to provide a return gift. And, and these are the lived experiences that I think get sidelined in formal, structured forms of interfaith dialogue. And that brings Jackie's question around, you know, what do we mean by dialogue? And I've grappled with this um, for a long time. Do we mean the structured forms of dialogue that are taking place in this room, that are taking place you know, across the country, across the globe in various contexts? Or are we actually talking about the encounter between with the different other encounter that is meaningful simply because of its mind? Um, a lot of reflection over a decade or so, and I really knew the latter form of dialogue, the informal form of dialogue that is that is that takes place, you know, without any stimuli other than the coexistence of two or three people who want to make two or three people in in, in a similar sort of vicinity doing similar sort of things who want to make better sense. Better sense, you know, understand their own selves through understanding the other. We need that kind of dialogue, that kind of dialogue that is um, democratic, you know, grassroots. That is perhaps also informed by a shared purpose. But, you know, it might be anything. It might be a professional purpose. It might be car, you know, car sales, you know, trying to sell cars on, 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 you know, on the foreground, on the forecourt. How do they make sense? How do they create a space if their Muslim colleague wants to do it at one o'clock in the afternoon. So how do we how do ordinary people negotiate and, and surmount these theological, these religious differences? That kind of dialogue to me is really where the power lies. You know, all power is that kind of dialogue. Um, so Michael, you had a few questions. You had questions around lessons. And phrases like lesser heard voices. So we, we put the onus on the voices as being lesser heard, but sometimes it is society that creates, you know, minoritized hierarchies, you know, hierarchies that minoritize particular groups. And, and I think the challenge for us is to surmount those hierarchies and to challenge politics of minoritization to include these voices who are lesser heard. I have a student, Suzanne Vernon, Reverend Suzanne Vernon, who's she initially, she, she's changed the title now because she, she had to, but her, her PhD was in dialogue, interfaith dialogue, a violence against women. And, and the reason she entitled her dialogue in, in 
and entitled a PhD in that manner was because she said women were maybe not systematically, but consistently excluded from spaces, formal face, spaces of clinical time. And then even when they were in the dynamic, who speaks first, who speaks when, and whose you know, word holds more value. Um, it isn't the women's fault that they were less than her voices, but, but rather the dynamic to be less than her. And I think in, within interfaith dialogue, we've really got a responsibility to challenge these, these hierarchies, be they gendered hierarchies, racialized hierarchies, or even hierarchies that mean perhaps the humanist is excluded from particular spaces. Again, when I was doing field work for Colera a decade or so ago, it was interesting that the dialogue spaces that welcomed, you know, that were started out as Christian Jewish uh, tables, then were proudly included the Muslims and the Hindus and the Sikhs, and then they were and innovative. They took uh, first steps to include humanist voices, and so they were very proud of themselves. But then I spoke to pagan communities in, in those cities, and they were like, they include everybody, but they were nothing or everybody. Um, again, less of her voices. Um, you then asked me how to how talk about faith. Um, it is important. When I provided case studies that I provided, you know, the, the protagonists in those stories did talk about faith. But what I spoke about is in they spoke about faith in ways that were accessible, that were not necessarily uh, colored by theological dogma, but I think even more than that, in, in, in ways that were everyday, in ways that were ordinary, um, in ways that were common, because the young people on, on a university campus, they are really worried about you know, doing well on their course, about taking careers, post academia. But within that, from each of them, whether they were the Muslims, the Jewish, the Christians, or the non-religious students, the identity that they were going through. Um, and so it is important to talk about faith, but in ways that are accessible and, and in ways your identity position can, can empathize with. Muslim approaches to the sake to sacred, oh no, your question, but the next question was about. Theological. Um, that's a difficult question. We could be here for the rest of the complexity and diversity around engaging with Islam entire, and anything I say to you could be picked up and challenged by somebody, someone else, you know, somebody from somewhere else who speaks from a different identity position, but make theological um, Section on Ulf and Ada, Ulf relates to the customs of, of people, and Ada um, it translates basically to the habits. And that is to interpret religious scripture in ways that respond to the context, lived context of people who need that interpretation. Muslim communities who needed sets of understanding that helped them you know, differentiate their faith, um, fast forward to today, the you know, British Muslims need understandings of their faith that helped them settle. There is room within theological implications and theological systems to allow for that flexibility, um, to allow for that engagement. As long as you remain to the core values of Islamic belief. First, the, the five core beliefs that I do not need to repeat today, as long as you stand with them, there is a lot of flexibility. I like to give the example of prayer timings. Now, those of you, you know, everybody knows Muslims pray five times a day. There are particular bands of time. When you pray, um, also, and then this it doesn't get spoken about enough. So any prayer you take, say the afternoon prayer at one o'clock, also in you know 1:30 or so, somebody either pray 
earliest point of that band, or you can play it, you can say or play at the latest point in that you know, time band when you play. So it's basically your afternoon, your day prayers, and you put an hour or longer within which you can play. But this band of time really gets expansive when it comes to the asar or the early evening prayers. And sometimes you can find Muslims arguing, you know, the Hanafis like to pray at the latest possible time, the Shafis, another mother, like to pray at the earliest possible time. And, and in Muslim context, you often find, you know, competitions with the Shafi Azan going at around four o'clock, say, summertime, um, the Hanafi call to prayer going much later. And, and people, you know, call to the oh, they don't get it. Um, <laughs> But actually, that is within Islamic theological. Okay, different people's professional family duties, there is space that allows for people um, their practice in different ways, contingent to the context. Um, and, and that's the kind of theological interpretation, the, the egalitarianism within theological interpretation that I try to emphasize. In my work. Finally, about 30 seconds, you know, Jackie, you spoke about the sociological word, altering prejudicial views and, and the potential there. Um, I think you do, you're very generous. A lot more debates, a lot more arguments to be had. And I think this emphasis on the tradition, and then you really liked the, the, the children in care work, this emphasis on the tradition. Um, this emphasis on in, in the social work case study where social workers who were secular, who were non religious, who came from also Muslim backgrounds came. <laughs> to me, that was really powerful. It wasn't about upskilling, it was about religious literacy, but it did engage, in, it ended up engaging in dialogue and perhaps. The most potent level, the most intrinsic level, people giving up their time to meet the other's need, to understand and to care for the other who was in a position of vulnerability. So I've rambled a little bit, but I've tried to stick to time and hopefully I've done okay. time but also uh, that you, you know, been properly engaged with detail and difference and nuance in presentation and have attempted in Saria's case to respond to these diverse uh, comments observations critiques um, and just going before we open up now into the wider forum say those of you who are in this room if you didn't have chance to grab uh, a glass of water or coffee and you would like to do so please do so because our break won't be for another um, hour or so so um, please do that and then just to um, as a preliminary before opening it up uh, both to those in the room and those who are with us um, online where I think there might have been some uh, sound difficulties but hopefully we're overcoming those apologies if that's been the case. Um, what I'm quite keen that we try to do is not, so to speak, ask questions to the speakers, in, except perhaps uh, maybe for some clarifications of things that were not able to be developed as much, but for you yourselves, the rest of you, to be participants um, in a discussion around the themes that have been raised in response to Saria's paper. Um, so that you can also feel, please, able to contribute from whatever position you're coming at this from, uh, and not just, so to speak, ask questions of the people um, around the table. So we'll see if that can work. Um, we'll see if it can work in a disciplined way and in an open way and an engaged way. It's not always easy to do, particularly in uh, a largest room where we have about, um, for those who are not present with us, probably 25 odd people here, I think. I'm not quite sure how many we have online. Uh, 10 online as well, so it's quite a large group. Um, so we won't always be able to touch base with everybody, but we'll try to do our best 
to allow you know, voices to contribute to the discussion of these kind of key themes that have been emerging. And I guess we might find, as we go through responses uh, to the other papers, that some of these re-emerge in different ways. Some of them might become totally new and not been touched on at an earlier part in, in our discussions. So those of you glad you've had a chance to grab something um, in the room. So um, let's now open that discussion up. This is also not to exclude uh, the four um, presenters in that respect. They not just to sit here passively and listen, they also to participate um, on that basis. But, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, a comment. You've spoken uh, about identity, uh, conviction, interconvictional. Um, and I want you to reflect on, on dialogue with four different positions. The position where identity is challenged through dialogue, the position where conviction, which doesn't necessarily change uh, identity, is firmly challenged, um, where they are between people who happen to just interact socially, the dialogue that takes that. So that's a kind of continuum where you go all the way from, is my identity on the line or am I just having a social conversation with my neighbor? Yes, if you want to start on that. That's, so I thought all month four and I heard four. four. Yeah, yeah the, the four are identity challenged, conviction challenged, dealing with socio-structural issues in dialogue and the cup of tea type dialogue with somebody. Of, yeah, Jackie's uh, cup of tea. Or coffee. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever other the liquid is possible. Yeah. Yes. Dialogue at the plate of the Musa dialogue, you know, depending on where you are coming from. That is, you know, step back. The kind of dialogue that I am talking to isn't quite the cup of tea dialogue at all. It isn't also the kind of dialogue where you're dealing with show political context, where you're, okay, wait, step it back again. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. The kind of dialogue I'm talking about is where there is a definite social purpose. There is a need, you know, children, young people on campus, British foreign policy um, that has an impact, you're right, on, on people's identity, on people's convictions, people feel it's challenged. Um, but by using the religion as a lens, you can address these issues without, well, the hope is that you can address these issues overtly politicizing them, but also without making them, you know, unpleasant. Jeremy asked me if, they, you know, included in his little thing, this, in his response, for this, this sense that Muslim engagement in, in dialogue is patchy, although, you know, you'd expect more of it, you'd expect Muslims to engage in dialogue, partly because and to stereotypes of their faith, and there isn't enough of it, but I think you know, both your question, your comments as well as Jeremy sort of dovetail together and, and address the same sort of issue in different kinds of ways. Um, and that there is that enduring challenge. There is that enduring challenge that people have nine to five jobs, they've got children to look after, they've got lives to live. Is it apathy that they don't want to engage in dialogue? Or is it that they feel there's an insecurity, I go into a dialogue space and some of my core values are going to be challenged, some of my core values are going to be dismantled. I, I remember um, in, in, again in northern town telling me they didn't really like sending their children on school visits to churches because they felt their children were too young and impressionable and their structures of identity would be somehow violated, their structures of belief would be violated. Live around and, and you know wave these issues away. Um, because you know, 
the identity in this country is at the other end of, of many marg marginalities. But there are migrants who, who came here in the 60s and the 70s. Often education levels are much lower than, unless, if, unless you're from of Indian heritage, education levels tend to be much lower than, income levels tend to be much lower. Um, and if you are a woman, then it's a double penalty there again. So that interfaith dialogue must take place in the context of all of these social systems that minoritized Muslims in this country in different ways. As a cup of tea dialogue is, is not sufficient. Um, And when it comes to dealing with the big socio-political issues through dialogue, again, you know, I think Shalina Begum writes about the, the, the millennials. And in the context, you know, she, she describes the millennial Muslims as well. And there is a lot of agency in this new Muslims who are inherently as British as they are Muslim. You know, and who can take this back? I have to have a couple of observations in at this point, and then we'll bring in somebody from on screen. Um, so when I listened to Sario in particular, I, I'm reminded of Michael Taylor in his presentation, talked about the role of the World Council of Churches among Christians, and a particularly key figure in that was uh, Professor Diana Eck. And she always used to speak about the dialogue of life. <laughs> uh, and. The cup of tea dialogue is a bit different than that because that's like an organized initiative. Um, it's a, at a certain level, but it's about let's uh, go and meet or try and greet. And it's yeah. about constructing something around a cup of tea. Yeah. Whereas what you're talking about, I think very often is in the course of other things, engaging in this dialogue, either purposeful things for training purposes or one could also take examples such as people who are neighbors with each other and somebody's neighbor has a bereavement in their family and what do you what does one do in that context is that the dialogue of life um so uh, just an observation on that I'm, um, I'm not sure i really understood your question uh, whether you were offering a typology of dialogues <laughs> or something else. Um, I mean, the cup of tea dialogue, I, you know, I'm a bit amused by this. That's accidental dialogue, isn't it? You know, you're just living with people and conversations happen. But were you offering a typology or were you saying these should all somehow be brutally interconnected? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm effectively saying I, I think it lies on this spectrum. Uh, I mean, I, I I, I, I don't take, take up too much time. I sit on a group of um, highly regarded Muslims, Christians, leaders, etc., MPs, etc., on that group. And our focus is how to create frameworks to engage, particularly with young people, to prevent radicalization. It's not the prevent program, it's more what happens in the social context. Um, this is mainly around the town of Pye Wickham. Where there's a very large Muslim population as well. And it operates on all these levels. And through having got to know each other over years and years, we can actively challenge each other's identity and beliefs because we're comfortable with each other, having built up through those levels over many years that this group has been, been operating. That there isn't this fear, you know, and you can actually say, you know, I pray to, that, my, that my Muslim friend's soul will be saved. I, say, I pray the same for you kind of thing. It's, it's at that sort of level where it's really deep and your core identity, but it, the challenge almost slips away because you are comfortable with everyone who you respect and knows where you are and you're actually all interested in the same things. But then I wonder how far identity and beliefs stroke can be. I think it can strongly be illustrated in the Jewish case, but not only the Jewish case, but there are many Jewish people who would strongly affirm Jewish identity of atheist conviction and not of Jewish religious conviction. Yeah, I, I, so, I so, and the identity thing there remains very strong and sometimes feels very threatened, but it's not at the level of conviction in that sense or ideational conviction. 
And I wonder, you know, how far in different social contexts, identities become very much the focus also of these power dynamics. Mm -hmm. Well, then convictions, question mark, mm -hmm. and make it difficult to have an interconvictional <laughs> engagement because the identity that the individual feels within the social environment that they're set. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But we have, we'll come to you, sir, in a moment. We have one, uh, I don't know from whom, Anthony, please. Yes, from Saida. So, Saida, if you help. If I what, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> you are unmuted by the sounds of it. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I've been, I've been able to just kind of like catch the gist of what's going on. So, forgive me if I'm asking something that's already been addressed. Um, and and I've been sitting here listening and kind of wondering, so what what's in it for them? Right. So why participate in conversation and dialogue? And, um, uh, you know, there are a, a full range of conversations, as, as I've heard being discussed from the, you know, um, coffee and cake type thing to something that's perhaps much more influence influential and um, kind of engages with policy setting. But I think I'm just wondering, you know, what is it in it for individuals that are participating? Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps part of the reason why I ask the question is because when I am in an interfaith type setting, I'm kind of wondering, so why am I here? What is what am I contributing? How is my knowledge or the discourse moving forward? And I think um, if, if I may, when the objective of the conversation isn't clear, and perhaps that's <coughs> what, um, we get a little bit lost and we don't know if it's been effective or not. And to be honest, the same applies in a conversation that you're just having in the line in a coffee shop because there is no objective. The objective there maybe is just to spend time with somebody that you don't know. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering how, and, and maybe another kind of follow-up thing is, so how do we then, um, have the engagement so that we work out what a coll collective objective is. Um, and if, if I may, I think that um, certainly for me, the key thing in, in having these dialogues is that my core identity doesn't slip away. That actually my core identity remains completely 100%, and yet I can still show up and have dialogue with other people and they respect... Um, the choices and the decisions that I've made in terms of having that identity. Thank you, Samir. Um, I think you know you're putting forward there. I guess you know is there a single model of what dialogue is or for, or might there be multiple models that could be applicable? And the importance then, precisely as you're saying, of clarifying. In what is it that we're engaged when we say, either we say or we start to do something, so that um, one doesn't get an inherent disappointment because different people are thinking it's about something else. Um, so this clearing of the decks, I guess, um, around any particular engagement, verbal or any particular project, you know, what is this that we're doing and on what basis, what are its parameters, maybe? Which isn't to say that one couldn't be doing something else dialogically, but different to that, maybe, question mark. Thank you very much indeed. For those, those reflections, I, I'd like to suggest that perhaps, you know, when you are having that cup of tea with that random person, perhaps the object of meeting somebody and talking to somebody whom you haven't spoken to before, perhaps that is an objective that's worth meeting, you know, in its own right. Sometimes in dialogue, we don't really need big, complicated, I'm going to change the world objectives. You need simple objectives that I'm going to understand myself and this, my neighbor better. And maybe we're going to smile at each other a bit more. And, and, and to me, that is, Pretty is it, it, a very good objective for, for interfaith dialogue. You know, another one of my students is also 
a pastor stands out outside the church every now and then with a little placard. I am your local pastor, come and talk to me. Um, and she's had some amazing conversations because of that. Um, on Mom's Net, you have shout outs. I am a Muslim and you can ask me any question you want to. It, it does work well, some awkward questions, some very nice ones, but a lot of online dialogue taking place. But then I think in terms of objectives, that is also the more structured stuff, like the, the example I keep coming back to today, like the social worker example and coming together to talk about Islam. The reason they had a very clear, the social workers are really, really busy people. They've got workloads that are much more manic as compared to you, know, you and I. They came into that room, spent six hours, you know, listening to your truly, who can tell a joke or two, but, but you know, otherwise baffles a bit. You know, they spent six hours because they wanted to better understand how they could service some of the most vulnerable sections of society. So for them, their purpose in engaging the dialogue was very clear. And so I think I agree with you, there is there is a continuum of approaches and, and reflecting the continuum of approaches that are. You know, a continuum of, of objectives and purposes that indicate our life and life. Your example of your pastors who come and talk with me. Um, I know in university settings in the UK, not in the context of the academic life, but in the context of the social life of universities, very often what's called living libraries um, has been used quite a lot. Um, that people, in a sense, advertise themselves as a living library for whatever religious or philosophical conviction or come to, you know, I'm a pagan, you have an idea of what the pagan is, here am I on a living library, so to speak. So it's, it's a variant um, on that. With regard to cups of tea, <laughs> it, you know, in my own experience, when I was much younger in Manchester, where Michael and I shared, I remember I used to get very frustrated that I couldn't enter into what I understood at the time as theological dialogue with Jewish people. But then one day, a very good Jewish woman friend of mine wrote me a poem, which spoke in the poem of your crosses crossing my ancestors out. I saw the significance of organizing a cup of tea because that was going over an enormous chasm of corporate Christianness, which I didn't want to acknowledge my part in because I thought I wasn't that kind of Christian that would have done that. But somehow I began to realize that I can't abstract myself from that. Your cross is crossing our ancestors out. And that therefore, even organizing a cup of tea was like a big step over a chasm. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, oh, thank you very much. Uh, just um, an observation, uh, you know, bearing my head of a historian. Um, this Muslimness has become very pervasive <coughs> in the second generation, and to some extent in the first generation as well. But the second generation, because being a Pakistani or a Turk or an Indian or a doesn't make that much sense, it's territorial. More than 80%, I think, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, either born here or grown up here. So, though last week, uh, before I came to this seminar, there was another seminar, Ayadi, who is a Turkish American professor, and he challenges this whole idea of Muslim world. He thinks it's a good idea or whatever, eternity. Mm -hmm. But my feeling is that this Muslimness gets stronger, despite all the variation. Somebody may say, I'm a cultural Muslim. I'm not a practicing Muslim. I'm a secular Muslim. Mm -hmm. I have come across Muslims who are saying we are atheist Muslims. Mm -hmm. So this Muslimness is not theological. Though for many of us, Muslims, Islam is part of this Muslim. But is it because of this history in Europe? that, uh, I mean, what Muslims remember, what happened to Muslims in Portugal and Spain after hundreds of years. I remember too, when I was working on diaspora Muslims, this Andalusia syndrome, this term came back, 
on the one hand, we were celebrating 500 anniversary of uh, yeah. quote unquote discovery in the Western Hemisphere. But at the same time, it happened to the Muslims and Jews in Spain and Portugal and the indigenous communities later on, elsewhere. Could you tell us what you mean by Andalusia? Andalusia means that uh, they were either assimilated or they were kicked out. And eventually, the Muslim factor in Spain after hundreds of years uh, vanished. So, end of Muslim presence, physical, cultural, intellectual, even in history books from Spain. So, that's called Andalusia because the last section of Muslim community was living in Granada and, you know, sort of Eastern part of So, so 1992, when there was celebration, there was also introspection or introspection of what happened to the Muslims in Spain and Portugal. And then some people even started writing about Muslims in Sicily. And this was the time when um, Yugoslavia fell apart. And they saw these European Muslims in Bosnia suffering. So is this Muslimness, you know, largely kind of anchored on this sense of history? I'm, I'm not saying that fear or apprehension or the guarantee for any community to stay together. I know, I mean, that the Jewish community has alerted us right to what happened to the Jewish people, you know, for centuries. But Muslims also have that sense of fear on the basis of this history in Europe. Mm -hmm. So do, do you think that, despite the fact that some Muslims are not practicing, I mean, this few, like, I think it's the practicing people across all these religions are not more than 20%. They are a small minority. So this Muslimness beyond religion is due to all these factors, immigration, second or third generation, and largely because of this history. I reflected on, on this sort of, you call it Andalusian syndrome, quite, quite a bit. I mean, in, in my work as, as a Islamic, feminist scholar, and it's, it's very obvious in sort of hijab practices. You know, when you look at the first generation, like the 60s, 70s, um, there was a lot less hijab wearing, but there was also a lot less, you know, articulation of one's faith in, in public spheres. Um, there was also a of that you can chart of, of collaboration around ethnic lines. So all South Asians, whether they were from, you know, South Asian diaspora community here, whether they were of Muslim or Sikh or Hindu heritage, whether they were from, you know, Indian Pakistan. Work together, and you can trace that through the archives. And you can see, for example, in Coventry, where I come from, there are archives that show how the Muslims and, and the Hindus and raised for the Muslims. Um, yeah, fundraised for the local you know, Gurudwara and the 70s, you see that kind of collaboration and you see this for a sense of minoritized you know, identity shaped, not marked not by religion, but by identity and, and shared, you know, by ethnic identity and shared cultures from, you know, the Indian subcontinent. Fast forward, and you write, come to the second and third generation, like uh, this is, is through the roof. Often you have daughters and granddaughters wearing hijabs in direct opposition to their families and see this as, you know, part of the backward culture that we left back home when we moved to Britain, wherever back home was. Um, and, and the hijab is only one ramification. You see this in the kind of activism that young people are engaging with. Now, I've, I've dabbled in a bit of history, partly relating to British Muslim histories from the turn uh, of, of the 20th century. And you see, you know, you start seeing people researching the histories of communities around the first mosques in Britain. The first mosque was Liverpool um, and, and walking in the same year. There's a lot, there's burgeoning interest in the people who lived in communities, who founded those communities. And I, I put it down to a sense of you know, young British Muslims wanting this rootedness, this historical rootedness. Is wanting to 
set aside the ethnic identification, the ethnic loyalties of their parents' generation and create a Muslim myth that is more shaped by uh, British values, whatever they are, but shaped also by British sensibilities, standing in a paddling, like our elderly gentlemen, um, but also shaped in some ways um, by the you know, encounter with a liberal capitalistic market, you know, marketized environment. But it is quite complicated. To me, it does not emerge from a sense of fear. It, it almost emerges from a sense of, of confidence, you know, a sense perhaps of uprootedness. They do not really have connections with India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh, but also a sense of quiet confidence that, you know, having been brought up here, having studied here, speaking the language, being very uh, effective in, in managing, in being part of British civil society in ways that their parents and grandparents would not. Um, so I wonder whether it's coming from this space of confidence. And you're absolutely right. You know, secular Muslims don't want any at the same time want to uh, defend almost apologetically cultural tropes of their Muslim identities. And this, this cultural Muslim identity might, might draw inspiration from sources as wide as, you know, Bali, it called, what's this called? Riz Khan's watch test? Who, can any, does anybody remember? No? But the actor is card and got some test about whether or not something is Islamophobic, I think. But it's to do again with his acting in, in Hollywood films. So it can range from things like that to things like did Shakespeare have, was Shakespeare, you know, inspired in any way by my you know, Islam? Also things that you think wouldn't really fit under the idea of Muslims, but again, you also then find in relation to, for example, faith practices, let's take uh, Sufism, for example, <coughs> um, moving away from uh, or, or, you know, Tarika, school of thought-based forms of Sufi practice, you know, 60% of South Asians in this country are of Indian heritage, Indian Pakistani, Bangladeshi heritage for the reliance, again, on figures like Mawlana Rumi from Turkey, who seem in some ways as westernized, but also, the whole Turkish project has been closer and more. Interesting what's happening with Muslimness. Uh, but I think it emerges from a position of confidence rather than from a um, position of fear. Okay, so I think we're going to need to move on into the next phase. We've got a number of issues coming left on the table from that around perhaps the relationship between religion and culture, can one distinguish between these things or not? Identity on the one hand as being sometimes a sense of being under threat, and on the other hand as something that empowers. Mm. Um, and I, one of the, I think it was Michael in the earlier discussion said, I think we might need to come back to the question of power and power relationships more and maybe we will do as this uh, as this proceeds throughout the afternoon um, so we move now to um, the next phase where our speakers respond to um, uh, to jeremy rodell's uh, humanists and dialogue um, and then he has the opportunity to respond to that and then we'll open up and after that we have our uh, mid-afternoon break so, oh, okay. Are we supposed to be able to read that? I don't know what keeps. Um, move it. Yeah. Ah, okay. Is that making sense? Does that make sense? Remote people better? having some interference difficulties, and they think it might be Saria's laptop. So, then. is that better? You are with us remotely. Is the sound better now? Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. It was my laptop. Okay. I, I'll, I'll put it away in a bit, but I needed to, to respond to your. So, <laughs> into your hands. Sorry. Thank you. 
I thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much for your paper. I really, really enjoyed reading it. And just as you sort of uh, started off your response to my paper, I think there's a lot that we agree upon in relation to interfaith, interconnection, and dialogue. Um, and certainly, you know, the need to include voices. Indeed, um, when I read the title of your paper, um, I felt it was a bit of a shame that, you know, given the long history of non-religious voices and non-religious actors in British society, and also given, you know, anywhere, but that, given you know, the statistics that anywhere between 25% and 50% of British uh, communities is present as non-religious, I felt it was a bit of a shame that we still had to create spaces where non-religious voices mm -hmm. felt that, you know, they had to, they had to argue, they had to engage in activism, you know, in order to, I think it should be a given that, that you are um, included simply given, you know, the, the numerical uh, presence of humanist uh, populations in this country, but also, I think, given the similarities in the positionalities that we take in relation to interfaith dialogue. Um, you state in sort of the defining uh, of, of humanist positionalities in relation to dialogue. You say humanists see secularism as a key element of that, of a better society on the basis of fairness, freedom, and peace, meaning that the state should be neutral in matters of religion or belief. Everyone should have freedom of religion or belief. Now, again, in my work with Paul Weller, who's sitting next to I think around our religious identities, around what you know secularism means. Um, and when I read this sentence, I agreed with it, but I was also minded by the diverse ways in which secularity, secularism, but also then you know implemented in various contexts, coming here again to what you know Michael spoke about as sort of contextual approaches. So we spoke about contextual approaches to faith, but also contextual approaches to secularity. You see the British example, which seems on some ways to be, you know, I'll describe it as all thinking, all dancing secularism. Running out of chairs. <laughs> Secularism, that is all singing or dancing, I, I describe it, but you know, that is fair tolerance and that is um, inclusive of diverse ways of believing. Um, there is a French version of, of laicite, which perhaps not necessarily as inclusive, not, you know, on the one hand, you have a sense of state neutrality, but then you also have. Um, Examples where the state is 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 less neutral, and and you know I'm I'm thinking about issues around again the French elections um, earlier this year. With Frank, that was you know, one of the pins uh, on, on on which it was focused. We considered postponing our holiday to France if the other person won, because my husband was a bit worried about me and my burkini on the on the beach. I did not take my burkini. Well, just to make that clear, um, but there are those, you know, there are those debates. Secularism can mean lots of things to lots of different people. I'm also thinking about Indian secularism at this point in as a well, let's just say a big question mark um, on it in relation to the treatment of minoritized faiths, also in relation to the treatment of minoritized sex sexual identities um, and, and the treatment of women. So there is something there. Can you know what does secularism really mean, um, and, and how do we ensure that in current politicized context, states are actually neutral in relation to religion or belief? Um, you then go on uh, to cite the Humanist UK definition of that as engagement between people with different approaches by common ground. And, and where it makes sense, engage in shared action. Humanizing the other is, is a key objective. And I, I could not, I, 
I think this strongly aligns with what I've been saying, you know, what I've written about in, in relation to interconnection and dialogue. Um, in relation, you know, to what our colleague online shared um, purpose uh, and, and engaging in, in shared action. So there's a lot um, that we engage, you know, that we agree upon, and, and I couldn't then we'll all be happy. Um, finally, I wanted to talk about this bit about, you know, interfaith dialogue towards the end there. You know, it's one of the challenges we, is, is that we constantly become involved in interfaith dialogue. Are, those are already committed to it. You know, you're, in some ways, you're all, we, are, we are almost preaching to the convert to these are people. The people Who come to it because you know interfaith dialogue makes sense in their life. What about the vast majority of people who are either too busy because they've been to school run and whatnot? All those who do not, all those, you know, there's a growing movement towards you know populist discourses, right, you know, right-centric, right-focused populist discourses that. centric notions of you know, your European identity. How do we incorporate those? That is a big, big, big challenge as we move forward. And I think that is something that inter interfaith dialogue um, practitioners are going to need to consider. Indeed, a lot of you know the campaigning around Brexit, for example, was hinged on, on the different migrant other and the need to curb the different migrant other you know, they are their pathways into this country. And you see that over and over again. Windrush, you know, Ravanda. Um, is that too, too far beyond the purview of interfaith dialogue? Or do we engage in these discourses and, and enable some sort of meaningful change? Um, as in the last two, three minutes, I've got another story um, from, from my team work. As you know, I like my stories. And this is a story of focus group discussion that, that I've been running um, in a city that, that had very little diversity. For people who had various non-religious identities and, and in the room, I've run five or six of those. Um, and, and across these focus group discussions, we had a variety of non-religious identities, humanist identities, secular, atheist identities, I describe as you know non-religious because they don't really outside not having a stronger sense of their non-religiosity. And this, all of my focus group discussions, there was an underlying tension. There was, um, but in this, the one that I'm going to tell you about this, it really came to fore. And this was tension between different non-religious identities, and and the humanists were quite. And I'm not saying this simply, you know, because I want to be in your good books, but the humanists were, quite, were quietly and consistently committed to interfaith dialogue and saw the need to engage with um, in these focus group discussions. There were also particular atheist identities, perhaps more radical atheist identities, who felt that religion needed to be banned, put off. And, and during this focus group discussion between different non-religious identities, there was actually dialogue taking place. Um, uh, the humanist refusing to be shushed by the atheist, um, and the atheist going on and knees trying to grapple and say, look, no, I'm, I am religious, I don't belong to this group. Let the other person speak. Um, how do we engage with that tension? How do we include Elements of religion in contemporary context. And 30 seconds to spare, I shall stop. Oh, you see, technology is not only the laptop, but the phone is in place oh, with the, the, the countdown of the seconds. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Sorry, uh, for opening up your response. And we move now to Michael's response to Jeremy's. 
over on okay, well, I don't have uh, your technology. <laughs> <laughs> but you have me as a chair, Margaret. So yeah, well, should that's, you... that's the more scary. <laughs> <laughs> six points to raise uh, as well as thanking you for a paper I also felt at home in listening to if I can put it that way um, and following the comments that came on the screen that said why you know we have to ask ourselves why are we in, entering into dialogue now sat here saying why am I asking these questions <laughs> <laughs> um, probably for good and bad reasons um, the first one is to I think be sure between you and me that you do say that when we enter into this dialogue, whatever we're going to call it, let's call it interconvictional, that we are all on a level playing field. I mean, in the sense, to use different languages, we are all people of faith. We are all people with convictions. If you don't want the word faith, we are all people who believe certain things and don't believe other things. Uh, we are all people who have a worldview. We are all people who have constructed uh, or who are aligning up with constructed beliefs and convictions. And in that sense, we are all on a level playing field. Um, because some people, and it's not you, would say, you know, the kind of humanist is um, less infected by uh, these prejudices, it's a much more rational, sensible person than the rest of us, <laughs> as if they hadn't constructed something. Now, I think in your paper, you, you agree with that, but I would love you just to underline it when it comes to your own um, comments. Um, you know, atheists are as much people who are convicted, uh, convicted not of belief in the sense, but have a conviction. They are as much people with a conviction as are theists. Uh, the interesting one is about the agnostics. Uh, I would describe myself with regard to faith in God as a Christian agnostic. Now, is that just as constructed, actually? It gets loud. The... The Sorry? I think that was a, a background something. Yeah. Is that, it may have been somebody trying to throw oh. me off, off course, oh. but. Um, yeah. Is it just, it's interesting to me, is the agnostic position, which I suppose that's me, and saying, I actually don't know, uh, that I that pay more attention to mystery and awe than I do to whether God exists or not. Now, is that just as constructed as all the others? So that's point one. And mainly saying, are you affirming that it is a level playing field for all of us in that sense? Uh, secondly, a background here, I suppose, is that um, I grew up as a what's called a non-conformist, going to a Baptist church, and indeed I was a Baptist minister, and for various reasons I got fed up with it, and now I go to an Anglican church, and sitting in an Anglican congregation, all my old free church instincts come out <laughs> in a very aggressive way. <laughs> now, so the background to this one is that when I hear you describing the... Um, in this country, certainly, the decline in what we call religious observance, in the, um, which I entirely acknowledge, and I don't disagree with at all, but all my kind of now, I wish to defend religion. Um, why is that happening, you see? So I come to some questions here, which I think you also acknowledge. Your um, very interesting section, an informative section on what is happening, you know, to the Christians and the Muslims and so on, which can, cannot be disputed. My question to you is, is what you're seeing in the end more descriptive than it is analytical? Uh, are you tending to describe something which I can't deny and don't wish to deny, I have no reason to defend it? Um, have you paid enough attention to why this is happening? On the understanding, which was said in, in that session you spoke to, that of course it's not true, university is a very different picture. And maybe one of the interesting pictures is in, say, the United States, which to some extent, you know, has been influenced by some of what we call modernity, in a way perhaps that other areas of the world have not, which is not a criticism. Uh, and of course, you know, religion really sticks hard in, in many areas of the United States. However, analytical a bit more because what is happening here in my judgment 
goes back to several things, but great big things, one of which is the Enlightenment, you know, and the whole switch in the way we think we understand the world from a kind of authoritarian, revelatory kind of understanding to one that is built much more on empiricism, observation, blah, blah, blah. And the second one, of course, is globalization, that until many of us, and even in my lifetime, that until I came not up against, but in contact with, in a real sense, living with people of other religions, it never occurred to me that there was anything relative about my own. You know, there it was. And one didn't really begin to say, ah, oh, you know, this is all quite relative, quite contingent, uh, as are others. I didn't say that until I, I encountered what I call globalization and a real meeting and living with people of other religions. So I'm only, I'm only asking you um, not to agree with my analysis, which is rather puny in these circumstances, but um, there are two questions here. One is a fairly superficial one. It has a lot of this to do with uh, the institutions of religion in the Western world, as much as with the, um, the erosive effect, if we can put it that way, of secularization and so on. And has it a lot to do with inadequate and very questionable institutions? Um, and the other one is, it may not be met by religion, but is there something there in our humanity that can't do without something? Uh, to put it in a completely different way, I suspect that in most ways, because we talk about we all have our worldviews, we can't actually do without either accepting and adopting or building for ourselves what I call a habitat. We have to have some recognizable place, however fragile it may be, in which we can live. And a lot of the religious exercises of building, you know, religious faiths has to do with this fundamental human need. And where does that come out in your humanism? That's not, I'm not challenging humanism there, but do you see that, um, you know, within when you talk about worldviews? So there's something deep seated, which is met by many, for many, many people by religion, but it may be met by something else, but this way and that we can't do without it as human beings. So that's the second. Uh, the, the third one is, um, you talk on page seven, for example, at least on the, on, the, on the one that I've got, you talk about people who are hostile to dialogue. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate what I think I mentioned in my paper, um, hostile to dialogue, and therefore wouldn't dialogue about common human issues that was in all their interest to talk about, but they wouldn't talk about it. Uh, because behind what they saw as faith was history, you know, lots of unfortunate things that had happened and had driven communities apart. In other words, we must be very careful not to think in interfaith dialogue that we're actually debating about words. We're debating about all those things behind the words of which the words are the icons, as I like to put it. You know, people's histories, their experiences, their lack of power, they've got the power, so on and so on and so on. Um, the, on page eight, you raised the, you, you kind of complained a bit, which I understand, that in interfaith dialogue, I think at one point you said we only talk to the liberals. Uh, in another one, I think you said we only talk to the, oh no, the disinterested won't talk at all sort of thing. Um, that, that only for me underlines that the best thing is about those contexts in which we talk to one another about the human issues, problems, realities that we share. We may not share these faiths, but we share these realities. You know, and I quote examples which you're all familiar with, with very interfaith, very inter-ethnic communities that find themselves up against some of the things that you talked about, you know, powerlessness and uh, being written off and so on and so forth. Uh, in that context, that they talk, they have dialogue. And 
Why it's important to put it there mainly is because it is by definition inclusive. In, in the community discussion, you have got the liberals, you've got the illiberals, you've got the faith people, you've got the not faith people, and you don't have people are, who are disinterested in the same sense as I'm not interested in interfaith dialogue. Because I am interested, we're all interested in the fact our kids have got no prospects, and most of us are unemployed, and we're being done down by this person and that. So the whole discussion, by definition, becomes much more inclusive, and that is why I get fired up by it in that context, whereas I think I confess that maybe that's just caricature. I don't get very interested in sitting down with people and having a chat about faith. Um, and the last one that I wanted to raise was um, this kind of discussion that whether in the end it's better to talk about values and not to talk about faith. Uh, and maybe we can more easily agree about values than we can agree about faith, so it's a better way forward. Now, before I say anything else, clearly it's quite difficult to talk to agree about values. And if you take a big universal view, I mean, there's a horrible distance between people's values, so let's not too easily say it, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But the second thing, it raises the question about do values in some way have to be justified? And if they are justified, how do you justify them? Now, people around this table and on screen know, know a lot of this better than I do, but in, in the tradition that I have been taught in ethics and social ethics, you know, we, we kind of almost create a typology of how do you justify a value? You can justify a value, some people will justify it, on the grounds of their faith in some way, will have a theological, so you talk about theological ethics. Uh, McIntyre will say that nearly all of us are emotive, all we're saying is this is what we like, you know, it's emotive. Say the Kantians will say what's well, instinctive, but somewhere in all our makeup there's a feeling for the same values. Uh, a popular one is consequentialist, this is good because it'll have good results, which simply begs the questions about what you think of good results. So you kind of, does it need, um, do values need some rooting, some justification, or is it just that we try to find common values for which we may have different justifications? So that's my fifth copy. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Tabak's response. Um, first of all, thank you all of you for your responses. They are fascinating. And thank you for your paper. And like everybody else, there is so much there that I can agree with. Um, I sat for many years on the Interfaith Network. Um, and the purpose of the Interfaith Network, as many of you know, was not dialogue, but uh, organizing of society. Yes, that, that's what its purpose was. Making sure that uh, people in prisons had the right, right chaplains or that uh, when there was a service in the, uh, to celebrate something in real, with, with royalty that everybody got a look in. Um, but you know, um, and that was, and I remember the discussions there about whether we should include humanists, or whether we should include pagans. Mm. And pagans were far more difficult. Uh, <laughs> the is, uh, what about witches? Well, exactly. Um, mm. I'd like to meet to try and find out what, what it is about, but I, I haven't managed it, except in books, and I'm, I'm not sure. So thank you for your, you know, I, I was always in favor that humanists should be involved. Uh, fully in, in discussions of this nature. Um, I was fascinated in your that you made a difference uh, that you already pointed to between atheists and agnostics. I wasn't sure quite how this feeds into your, your human uh, framework. Um, but I have to also say that I know many humanist Jews, uh, not just members of my communities, um, 
And you know, one of the main reasons why people become Jewish in the progressive world is they fall in love with Friday night dinners in people's houses and the family and community. It has nothing to do with God or anything else. It's that human contact. Um, and they're also synagogues, humanist synagogues and humanist rabbis, um, which exist. Um, I find them difficult because I think there's a, a tension there between what I would consider Judaism and what they do. Um, uh, but that doesn't detract from a group that is separate that has humanist views. That to me is, is different. Um, it's probably the same as I feel uh, when people call themselves Jews for Jesus and Christianity. You know, I'm happy dialoguing with Christians. I find it difficult dialoguing with Jews for Jesus. I don't show them where they are. Um, so that is there. Um, there is um, also, um, when I was reading, one, one of the things about um, dialogue that has been raised here is, is, is you know, with the liberals that get involved. That to me is the joy. Dialogue is that you meet people who are lovely, but who are right, usually. Who are, you know, you, you, you really can sit and talk. Um, and, um, you know, one has to acknowledge that within all religious communities, I'll rephrase that. Um, within Judaism, there are many different groups, as you probably know. And the only time many of these different groups get together is when they are involved in the um, in, in, in sort of interfaith network type things or, or, or maybe um, some sort of dialogue. And, and the only other time they, they actually in any way talk to each other is when they're dealing with the vulnerable in the Jewish community or anti-Semitism, when everybody will work together or, or talking about Israel. So, you know, we're aware of this, the tensions. Um, and in, I, 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 I just was also, was, when I was looking at your paper, um, I was struck by your wonderful, wonderful diagrams. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a visual person, <laughs> so I do those. Um, but I think one has to always understand that trains change at incredible speeds. Um, and I wondered how you, you, you react to that. So I find, um, and I can only talk within the Jewish community, um, that in the younger generation at the moment, they are far more interested in spirituality and Jewish learning. There's a group of Jews, yes. I'm not talking about the Haredi, the, the very, very right-wing Jews, or the extreme left-wing liberals, but that sort of middle group. So that, for example, there is a conference held every year called the Mud in England, uh, which before COVID, had over 2,000 um, people involved in this call over Christmas. Every year, for five days, 2,000 people got together to talk about Jewish matters. Um, and that is a, a trend, and, and there is a growing in interest. Oh, sorry, that's my son. He's a rabbi. <laughs> Um, he wasn't bringing disputes with you, was he? You never know. <laughs> you might be sorority. listening in. He's <laughs> a sorority rabbi. He may well be. He's a different group. Really, um, where I was coming from, and um, you know, of course, common values and projects are, are so important um, in and, and acknowledging the, the humanist 
element in these is important to me as well. Um, there is a, a, a rabbinic story um, from the Talmud that says, you know, somebody goes to one of the rabbis and says, do you believe in God? And the rabbi says, no. And the student's shocked. And the rabbi says, do I believe I'm sitting on this chair? But it's not a actual thing. It's something to do with trusting and uh, history and all that was spoken of there. So um, I, um, I'm sorry that you have not felt um, fully acknowledged in what is your conviction in the interfaith dialogue. And I would very much hope uh, that this will be remedied in future dialogues. I, I, I'm a little confused sometimes when people talk about humanists and secularists and all these differences that we're talking about. That's really all. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much. We have uh, um, an extensive menu, again, one might say, uh, but we look forward to Jeremy's initial response and then we open up. <clears throat> thanks. Well, lots of very interesting points uh, you made there. So thank you, thank you all for that. Um, so let me just work through the things I've noticed. And there's some of them, of course, overlap. The first point I wanted to um, pick up was this question about secularism that was around the, the, the phrase. And obviously, what I've done is taken a, a, a sort of academic definition of it. Um, but you're absolutely right that I don't think there's anywhere in the world the internet does all those things perfectly. We are not a secular country, the Queen's head of church and we've got 26 bishops in the house of and that. So we're not so and I think that as it the we're practice probably one of the most secular countries in the world in terms of the bits that matter, the freedom of religion and belief and expression and so on. Um, Others, I think, reflect, well, everybody reflects that it comes back to this point about everyone brings their history. You know, France brings a history of anti clericalism, which comes from the French Revolution and the, you know, the ancien regime, the church was so involved in it and, and all of that. And the same applies to, you know, secularism in Turkey, which is mm. totally different from where they actually had a ministry that defined what the mosque would yeah. preach. You know, that's not secularism at all. But, so, but that reflects the, the fact that, you know, the, the, I think you can't escape from history on this. All I can say is what, you know, what's the ideal and how can you approach the ideal and, uh, and everyone's got some way to go to reach them. Just while we're talking about that, then, it's worth just trying to disentangle these terms that you took. So to me, that's secularism. So anyone, uh, any, you know, anyone, this room could be a secularist or it being favor just means you're you know to me you're in favor of the fact that the, the space is neutral and you know, the state doesn't discriminate against you because of your religion or so that's that's secularism um, um agnosticism and human very narrow thing. It means just one thing. You don't believe in God. That's it. You could be an axe murderer and you could be an atheist, or you could be the greatest human being that's ever lived. And be. It doesn't tell you anything apart from that one thing. Um, obviously, a lot of people who identify as atheists, they have a much broader world view. But, you know, I have to explain what that is. So, um, and obviously, agnosticism is a subset in the sense that you can be, uh, in its truest sense, of course, it means not fence sitting, but saying this is genuinely a question to which we can't answer, uh, lack of knowing. So, um, and then you say, well, how do I choose to live my life? And then there are people who, life as if the answer to that question is no. I don't think I really know it and so on. And even if you take the most hard line, um, you know, uh, 
as a scientist, he would always say, I'm not 100% because I have to be changed by new evidence. Okay, I don't think I'm going to get the evidence, but you know, I'd like to think I'm in that position as well. So, those does that help? Sort of, so, a humanist to me is a Summary, I guess. But in a way, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is given your religious, how do you lead a good life? A positive ethical worldview, not a negative ever guy things. Um, coming on to this question about dialogue, and we talked a bit earlier on about um, the what the definition is of, of dialogue, and it goes back to some sense your your question. Um, to me, um, a key thing about that is, is about your intent when you're, and to some extent also what it is, you know, and uh, it's not debate, you're not trying to win, that's a key distinctive, distinguishing thing to me. Group of faith and belief for them, I guess something, the charity based in London, in London And you know their big thing is dialogue, not faith. Um, uh, so, so it's not debate. The, the the intent is not is is is. Not. And um, I think it can be the I'm though I like the interconviction thing because I think it's it's it is good. I'm not sure it's sufficient because as somebody else said to me, if you look at you know, religion, belief, worldview, talking about here, it's got these three elements, you know, the, the, the belief, it's also got the identity bit and the practice bit, you know, and you're talking across all three of those in the dialogue, I think, that we're, we're, we're talking about. So, uh, and obviously they're, they're tied up with, with the... Um, um, this is a question about how do you include others? And it also goes back also to what Michael made, I think, here, which is, you know, how do you overcome disinterest as well? Which is, I think, a good Your solution is to say, well, don't worry about trying to do it deliberately. It happens naturally when people get together on a common interest and they have to come from different backgrounds. Sadly, we're in an environment where a lot of people live in, even me, living in a London environment, which is, is, is um, very ethnically mixed, but most of the ethnicities there are white. Mm -hmm. um, so, and lots of people live in parts of the country where they don't encounter people, and you don't get them. So I think you do, I'm not sure it's an either or, but I, I agree that all of those opportunities are great. When they're right, and they are definitely forms of dialogue, definitely. Um, uh, and um, and a lot of the you know the, the example I think I gave, which is about people working in pastoral support, right? mm -hmm. um, you know that dialogue all the time, just in, in the work that they're doing. Sometimes you've got to go out of your way to create those opportunities. So I, I don't think it's an either or. I think you have to do. Um, um, and yeah, when people are busy, what can you do? I thought there's one interesting thing that came up here, which I just thought I should mention, which is that even people are busy watch the telly or they go online. Here is, I guess, a lot of people here have seen it called Pilgrimage. You see that? Which is um, a serial, I think they're now in their third or fourth series, where they take a group of people from different. Oh, yeah. Grounds, mm -hmm. and they go on a pilgrimage you know? and they always have a, a real mixture of people and they do dialogue while they walk along a footpath in the rain you know or whatever it is or go up the you know the path of Santiago to Compostela or whatever it is and um in a way maybe if you can't engage people with dialogue maybe the next best thing is to show and tell you other people engaging in it because that is all part of humanizing the other second best case of the bedroom. Um, it is absolutely right that there's 
as someone said, that there's there is a range from you know there's people like me here in Gates and Dallas to people who are downright hostile, who are very anti-religious, including some people who would identify as human. It's a bit like most people. Um, now you can argue why is that? I think a lot of that, a lot of it, because people think it's a bad when you hear about religions. You, it's usually in the context of something bad, yeah. and so the impression get is religion is a bad thing. Or this is true of particularly, I think, um, it, some people I know who are ex-Muslims, where you've had a very hard time um, exercising your freedom. To, to change your faith or lose your faith. You may have been ostracized by your parents. You may have had your community, you know, threatening you. People like that, it's not surprising that they had their, and, and people who meet them, and that it also applies to people who come from other backgrounds, even ex-Catholics and so on, that's quite a common thing. So it comes back, I think, to Michael's point, you can never separate personal history from, um, now, Michael's point about everything being a, a construct, that's true. Um, and I would say that in all ideas, morality is a human construct, everything is a human construct in that, that, that sense. I, I uh, agree with that, and obviously, I think all religions are human constructs. Um, in terms of humanism being different, I think on in this interfaith world, it is different because it's still seen as an outsider. You know, it's still the case, and people question you. you know, I had to almost be interviewed before we were allowed to be represented on one of the two forums I'm on. And um, you know, um, it's also true that it has some qualitative differences because of this thing about being about. about Evidence based and changing the mind in the areas of evidence. So it doesn't have any <coughs> dogma, and it doesn't obviously you can say that so if you have a naturalist worldview, then obviously most faiths have some elements of supernaturalism in them, and that's problematic. But I think that's just the nature of difference, you know, that, that there are differences, and if you get high Christians, then you get differences as well. So I think. I, I hear your challenge, which is saying effectively, if I do you, do you think that actually humans come into it saying, well, okay, guys, you got all your, your sort of supernatural beliefs, but basically, right? Yeah. And of course, everybody can say that. Right. So, you know, yes, I'm not going to change my view, and I do think I've got it right. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that you think you're superior as a person to the other people. Uh, that's, that's the problem. In terms of the data, and uh, you, you mentioned the decline, I, I wasn't really talking about declining religious observance, though there is a decline in that, but a religious identity, that was the figures that I, that I quoted. And you're right that what I, I did was to give a, a description. I didn't give an analysis of why um, uh, that was happening. Um, and you gave some of the reasons, you know, the, obviously the people that since the Enlightenment, there of course, be growth in Christianity in the 19th century in this country, globalizing. I think you're actually right that the, the, the and I, um, this, uh, I guess most people here know Linda Woodhead, and she is very critical, says exactly this that the one of the reasons why Church of England would decline, but not its equivalent in Denmark, say. Is that they haven't followed the zeitgeist on issues like women's rights and LGBT church has, and I would say in fact now whether that's true or not, I don't know. But it's also true that certainly if you take the extreme example of Catholicism in Ireland, um, there's no question that that has been really deeply affected by the, the charging scandals and all of the other things going on. Hugely, hugely damaging as a result. And <clears throat> so you've got a situation where you've got a lot of people who still identify themselves as Catholics, but maybe cynical about the institution. So I, I, I'm not an expert in those reasons as well. So I don't know what we can say is what's happening. I think Jackie said, well, trends can change very quickly. And 
time. That's true. We can, in this case, we can see where things are going because of the demographic. So you can see what younger people are thinking. And so you can see what some of these trends are going to keep going. There's a generation, a cohort coming through. So even if everybody suddenly became deeply religious at age 15, you know, it was before that. that, that, that. The values thing, I take your point about, about values. I was going to talk in my response to you about your question about values and justification. So I think that's a very. It's a relief. The Interfaith Network for the UK, do you let the pagans in? Or, in fact, they did let the pagans in, and the humans are not in. But we have not to be in. Um, because I think that's yes, yes, and that's fine because it's the interfaith network mm -hmm. in the UK, so we're not the faith, and of course, because we're coping with the fact that there is a spe the spectrum of humans, view, some humans would be upset if we were. So, you know, we have great relationship with, with and Harriet Crutcher and everybody, so everybody's happy. You, know, <laughs> 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 you are members of the British Education Council, we are in the ones very so. early. Yes, and I think you see that as a very yeah. important issue. Uh, so, yeah, the, this question about talking to the liberals, yes, it's true, it's nice, and it's nice that people are nice. Um, in terms of, of um, social cohesion, then it's you probably talking to people very fundamentalist is difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to be careful with that. But I think there's a big group nice to find a way of reaching. And I think the sort of talking about common issues, which Michael's talking about, is that is very good doing that, given that a lot of those people just won't go out to a meeting or an event which is explicitly in the So I think uh, and it's interesting that you talk about. There's an interesting mirror between what um, I said and you said about younger Jewish people and young and the Muslims becoming more. Seems to me and this is about confidence in identity, you know, and I think that's that's fine. That's about learning to live with pluralism, but staking your your place and and. What's interesting, and that's why I think the values discussion is important, is would be to get behind that identity and say, well, you may have different identities, commonality in, in values. And I, my guess is if you take it an issue like, I don't know, LGBT rights or something, there's probably quite a big overlap with people on that issue, but there's generational differences. So that's why I think it, the values thing would be a very I think I've run out of steam here. Okay, so, uh, well, Jeremy, we, it's, uh, we've required stamina of you all, or us all, and uh, there's maybe another half hour and then we'll be having a break. Uh, at least those of us in this room and those beyond can also go and make their cups of tea or coffee or whatever. Um, some people at this point might say, well, let's stand up and wave our hands around or whatever, uh, but then that might be misunderstood for some kind of religious uh, expression or humanist <laughs> expression, I don't know, uh, but keep fit. But yeah, we'll get into this uh, discussion. Just two comments from myself. Um, Pagans have come up a couple of times, and just to say one thing, that this series has been very focused on, uh, in that sense, Abrahamic traditions and the tradition of humanism that in the Western world has, in a sense, come out of and or responded to those traditions. Um, but the Journal of Dialogue Studies edition into which these papers will be going um, has extended beyond that. And uh, I know we have at least one paper uh, in in uh, present under under review uh, from a pagan uh, giving pagan perspectives on dialogue. Um, so that's just to say that there is an inclusion in this little project, even if not in this space and time um, of the series. And the other thing to note, I think, um, here in this last discussion, the question in a way of God or what is signified by the word God. 
um, has come forward a little bit more maybe than in the first discussion, either by Michael's kind of speaking of himself as a Christian agnostic, but with allusions to um, that which is the mystery of life, um, and by references all, and by the discussion around atheist, humanists, where these boundaries are, and by Jewishness along a spectrum. Um, so uh, it may be interesting to open up that a little bit, um, you know, where that, particularly because uh, we're not here in the, if we had Hindus here, they may be wanting to speak about gods or not gods. <laughs> and that's an important part of the uh, debate. But um, like our sister reminded us, um, you know, we can only, in a sense, have parameters for particular debates, which is why at the moment it's as it is in these traditions, though in the uh, Journal of Dialogue Studies edition, it will extend into these other traditions, which have other perspectives, more in that sense, plural perspectives on what is signified by this word, God. So, can I uh, please, Martin? only contribute a completely <laughs> unimportant anecdote that on the subject of pagans and witches, uh, I went to the Parliament of the World Religions. Oh. We were put into groups of 12 for whatever we now the conventional dialogue, interfaith dialogue. And in the group of 12, there were eight American women who were either witches or pagans. <laughs> and I felt very challenged. <laughs> so they, I mean, you had to, I, if I was honest, I had a job to take the situation seriously. Mm -hmm. And after a time, I thought, well, I've got to try. It was just an overwhelming sort of experience, completely out of my experience. Yeah, and of course, in a sense, the word pagan itself, at least within the Abrahamic traditions, has a loading onto that word uh, of a negativity in itself before what even starts with anything else. Um, but yeah, thank you, Mike. When, when I met with pagan was part of my research, again, it you know, we're trying to incorporate different voices in their communities. Yes, there was that initial, oh my gosh, is somebody going to, you know, cast a spell on me or something. But once I overcame the, the conversations that we had, I think were, were insightful. There were spaces for a lot of empathy within those conversations around shared contextual values. But what was, I think, really interesting uh, the overlaps between the naturalistic pagan belief the diversities of gods and um, the Hindu, you know, non-Semitic religion worldviews. Again, not similar, you know, commitment to seeing divinity in, in, you know, various aspects of nature. None of the pagans I spoke to was, was rooted in a multicultural society, very diverse, with strong Hindu coalition between the Abrahamic faith on the one hand and, and, the correlation, and, and the linkage that she had with Hindu communities. But also, I think, as we moved into these ideas of the divinity of nature, Synergies with Islamic theological concepts around, you know, why students see, you know, caring for nature, being inspired by nature. Um, and, and I'm also by my atheist colleague who said you know, she she does see spirituality in nature. And she says, you know, she goes into a beautiful cathedral and doesn't feel a sense of awe, but goes into a wood in early summer that has, you know, a carpet of um, and, and she is moved in a similar way as one would in, in, in a beautiful cathedral of the That's scary. I've decided they are in that scary. <laughs> now, I don't know whether this is Anthony himself or Anthony mediating the voice <laughs> from beyond, so to speak, in, uh, remotely. You know this, about me. this is Anthony himself. Um, <laughs> I'd be interested to hear a bit more from Jeremy in terms of whether you personally feel irritated or um, 
him slightly annoyed. And there's the answer, which tends to happen in some communities. I know within some African Caribbean and African communities, unless you're theistic and it's an assumption that most people are. So, you know, it's, I've even seen books that would say that Africans are incurably religious. It's a bit of a cliche, but, you know, gets, um, gets propagated in, in lots of the literature. And whilst I think there is, certainly in the US more so than here, a growing preponderance of the scholars are really interested in exploiting humanism, for the very reasons that you just said, it's not, an, it's not a reaction against it, it's a positive proposition for the sense of human agency. And, and the power of human imagination to create worlds without having to necessarily depend upon the presence of the divine, however, however one constructs that. There is still a sense in which if one then slips that further along the continuum, however, you explain these things eventually. And to talk about atheism, that then just garners a very different set of reactions, even though in popular parlance, certainly in at a more everyday experiential mm -hmm. level, people don't make any real distinction. So they will assume that unless you're positive theistic, humanism and atheism is kind of just different sides of the same mm -hmm. coin and they're both bad at each other. So, in terms of your perspective, I mean, how do you feel at that kind of slippage? Well, that's an interesting one because I don't think a lot of this is about terminology and, and this is baggage in terms of carry with it. So, the term atheist actually, I think. In this country, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it, it's not as negative, really. I mean, a lot of people say they're atheists, people don't care, you know, it's okay. If you say that in the States, <coughs> that's yeah. a big deal, you know. And it's, and part of that is because it was associated with communism and stuff, but it's really lock up your daughter's time, you know, with, with atheists. So, um, so I think some of it is about the, uh, about the context, and I think people sometimes see atheism as being much more sort of aggressive as a term. The problem we have, though, is that, going back to this identity thing, that whereas you may say, somebody says they're a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian, that might be a very clear, you know, or a Catholic, it may be a very clear sense of their identity. It may not tell you that much about what their beliefs are or their conviction. It is a clear mark of their identity. Um, in, in the case outside, in the non-religious world, um, things are, uh, are not so clearly rooted. As I think I, I explained in my talk, that, that you know, while we, we say, look at the data, about half of the non-religious have a broadly humanist worldview, you know, but themselves humanists. Mm. And, and some people say, no, I prefer to label myself as an atheist. Or I don't like labels. I refuse to. You know, I reject it. Okay. So it's it's in a way because we the, our framing of these things is is that labels have have are coming from a sort of religious perspective. They don't always work. You know. Now I like it if everybody who had a humanist world would call themselves a humanist. Okay. But the fact is that, that that they don't, and some of them may call themselves atheists. But I think in the context that you're meaning, in a, in a, a, a more Deeply religious community, and I know people. I think we talked about when I was here before about people who doesn't call a group called the Association of, of Black Humanists, and they, because they, they said, well, we 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 think identity because of our history, and because you know saying you're not religious is such a big deal. Where we're coming from, and um, you probably don't understand that in the same way. So it's a very complex uh, uh, picture, and I don't think we have to live with these illusions. The best thing you can do by me is, and then you can explain what you're doing. Uh, well, a uh, uh, hand raised from side again. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so again, just kind of hoping that I caught the gist of, of some of what was said. Um, 
I, I have a, um, a question, well, an observation or th a thought and then a, a, perhaps a question. So there's some really interesting um, uh, stuff that's happening in SOAS in terms of um, the work that they're doing on communities of inquiry and using that to train students and um, uh, academics on how to have these difficult conversations because I think somebody said that... that um, there are some conversations that are just too difficult. And I and I found that the work that they're trying to do there, because there are some subjects that are so sensitive in freedom of speech, et cetera, and universities are having a lot to deal with in terms of how much freedom of, what is freedom of speech? How much do they allow? I, I found that to be really interesting because it is coming, um, primarily, let's say, to address some of the theological challenges that are happening in a, a secular space. Actually, that training is then enabling conversations to to happen, um, you know, casually, but with more um, uh, understanding of the piece of difference of opinion. Um, and then the, the other piece was on for the gentleman who, who just spoke. Um, this piece about the identity. So, for example, I've done a lot of work on identity and I, I never place the identity of Muslim upon me. Other people do. And I know the, the kind of juxtaposition and irony in the statement that I'm making based on the decision of the clothing that I've selected to wear. But I've never placed that as an identity on me. It might be number eight, nine, ten in my list of identity markers, but it's always number one for others as they view me. Thank you. Can I just comment on the free speech thing and difficult conversations? And I think that's, there are some, there's some skills here about difficult conversations, isn't there? And I think one of the, 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 the simple, uh, the simplest thing I've seen about difficult conversations, and it's all about respecting the other person, even if you might disagree profoundly with, with some of their ideas, is <coughs> to uh, enter the conversation both with a goodwill intent, and also be willing to ask people if it's okay to ask them about something. <laughs> you know, that does is say to you, you know, I know this is a sense of, I'm, rec I'm giving you a flag, I recognise this is a difficult thing to talk about. Can we talk about it? And they have the right to say, I'd rather not talk about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And, uh, positioning it uh, mm -hmm. correctly. I would argue very strongly for, for uh, speech, but I think that there's a difference between the legal right for speech, which you must be strongly about, about that and so about our everyday interactions and about being polite and kind to people you know it's not rocket science is it? But, you know. okay um as human beings um values and religious or atrocities in the name of god um the most recent in the name of Islam, of Muslims, or a sectarian work in Northern Ireland, or uh, what lesson we can do from all these, not to repeat it in the name of these more <clears throat> humanistic donation um, labor. Yeah. Not the ah, well, <clears throat> yes, I, mean, I thought we, that was that's sort of adjacent to another very familiar uh, uh, challenge that I get as, a, as an atheist, which is to say, uh, you're a humanist, you say you're an atheist as well. Uh, you know, Chairman Mao was an atheist and Stalin was an atheist, look at all the terrible things that they did. You know, the atheist was dread therefore dreadful. That's the, the you know. You get that stuff all the time. And of course, it's a leading question because they weren't doing those things in the name of atheism. They were doing it in the name of an ideology. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, they needed atheism because 
religion would be competing with that ideology. So they were atheists, but you know, Pol Pot was he had a, an extreme communist and agreement. Um, so I'm not much So and in uh, yeah, and, right. and there are so many. So I mean, personally, I think all you can do with these things. You know, I'm very uh, have been involved locally in the Holocaust Memorial Day, for instance, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is covers lots of the numbers of genocides. Uh, but all you can do, I think, is keep reminding yourself the fact that humans can do this mm -hmm. and how careful we've got to be about. Um, but I, if there was a magic wand to turn that off, so key thing is is failing to humanise the other people. You, you can't send millions of people to gas chambers if you see them as fellow humans. Yeah. It's in Bosnia or whatever mm -hmm. Dehumanize the other was the was the tendency of the world. Just pick up one other point which Michael raised, mm -hmm. which it was alluded to, I think, sort of in some of the other questions, which was you said something about um, that is there something about a humanity that humanity that still has a need? To me, mm -hmm. that this is the the, the God-shaped hole. Argument, isn't there something inherent in humans? No, it's not my argument, wasn't it? Okay, well, I, that's as I, I don't go like, into the God shaped hole. You don't go into that, okay? You don't, oh, heard, no. no, that's as I heard it. And I think, um, uh, I think it may well be that if that uh, we're in the part of this is our human development, and maybe it's a, a luxury that we're not under threat, and we have a need for. Something to hang on to when you're under great threat. I, I don't know. Maybe my human is uh, perhaps an outcome of the luxury in which we would have been sitting in this room. I don't, I, I, and it comes back to the, the point that was made. I don't think very, very important thing is that the, the thing that is common is this sense, I, you know, humans tend not to use the word spirituality because it's got lots of baggage in it. But what we what people mean by having ability to have a sense of, of transcendence and mm -hmm. an ability to feel connected to, to other people, uh, and you know, you look at it, 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 being part of the universe. This, and I'll, I think I'll mention this later on. This is you know, being human, you know, and of course, you have that. And I think that is part of the human condition if that's what it was that you were referring to. Um, well, I'm thinking about what you said actually, but um, I, you see, well, you know, the Christian tradition has traditionally said that our problem is we're, we're sinners. Okay, so we set some reasonable rules, we decided to ignore them, so we've landed in a mess. Um, I don't think that's either true, convictional, uh, or helpful. Uh, I think that we are, if I can use the word existential, which is being used very much recently, I noticed it was a very strange word about 10 years ago. But existentially, we are people who are, by nature of our fragility as human beings, we are very fragile, we're very insecure. And I don't mean we're all psychologically prob problematic. We are, by definition, insecure people in a very fragile world. and. Uh, feeling in many ways not particularly safe. And this can range from, you know, what's going to happen to the world in the future with climate change, um, to what's going to happen to my relationships tomorrow, to am I going to get enough food, you know, all sorts of levels. And so then what we do is to, we take actions that tend to uh, defend ourselves, you know, and that leads to egotism and all the problems. But it's at that level that I'm saying that there is, is there something there that by virtue of our human condition, you know, the shape hole we need to fill, but is there something there by nature of this fragility of our human condition that leads us 
to create these habitats. And that it's very difficult. I mean, I'm not sure I know anybody, but maybe you'd be the first one who doesn't need that habitat. I'm only, this is only to say, I hope it's not the God shaped, you know, yeah. where everything else runs out, shut God in is the answer. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, I think I'd need, we need to have a long conversation yeah, to understand that. It'll have to but be what, another day, Jeremy, because I'm exhausted already. <laughs> well, what is, what are, let, let me relieve you that the break is coming soon, <laughs> imminently. Indeed, we can even do it now so that you can have a good 25 minutes coffee break, wander around. But of course, the speakers are invited to remain for dinner this evening. So if they manage to survive the entire day, uh, there will be that opportunity in a more leisured way and also more interpersonally to be discussed. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm sure we'll also come back to this actually because you know it's part of the stuff of, uh, of the other remaining themes, I think. So so let's take that not to cut it off but to recognize it as a very important point that we've reached in, in our discussion. See if we come back to that um, and take the break now. So, uh, if... <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a computer generated <laughs> meme. <laughs> Okay, so um, welcome back all in this room and welcome back uh, those who've rejoined us online and potentially also welcome to some who may have new joined us online because I know some were going to be engaged for part of the day and not all of it. So we're at the halfway point in our marathon. And again, thanks to particularly our four uh, presenters and engagers with one another, having had the patience and the stamina to uh, try to carry this through, um, as well as to those of the rest of us who are also it seriously. So thank you very much. Um, this morning we had responses to the humanist and dialogue, or not this morning, sorry, the earlier part of this afternoon. To the just humanist, feels like just feels morning. like this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I knew it was a mistake having him sit right next to me. <laughs> He's already, already said I'm, I'm full of prejudice because I see the computerized voice of the woman. <laughs> anyway, yes, so. Uh, humanists and dialogue, we've had the engagement with that presentation and with Muslims and dialogue. And this afternoon, this part of this afternoon, <laughs> we moved to engaging with uh, Michael's own presentation on Christians and dialogue, and then later to round off the afternoon uh, engagement with uh, Jews and dialogue. So we open up now um, with uh, Saria, her response. To Michael Taylor's Christians and Dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Michael, for allowing me, giving me permission to shout at you. I shall take off that point with the wake up. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, <laughs> thank you very much indeed for your paper. And, and again, and I don't know whether Paul has a hand in this, he probably does. I really did enjoy. Your paper, and I found a lot of you know common ground, a lot of space from which to you know interrogate these these power hierarchies that are you know that have been coming up over and over again today. Um, a need to look also at how our values and how our embodiment of our religious non-religious values are very much contextual, um, and how we need to, you know, interrogate our own personal positionality in religious or otherwise, um, and, and the privileges that, that come with them. So, so thank you very much. Um, in your paper, you, you know, you talk about, you know, under, you know, Christianity in a triumph, understood in a triumphalist way, Christianity is not genuinely open to dialogue, only to efforts to understand the other present in its own case. And note the similarities and differences. Um, many, 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 
Dr. David, the nub of the discussion that we've been having around how do you engage with those who do not want to, how do you engage with those who might be hostile to the idea of working with the different other, and a very particular understanding. I don't think it's the, the precarity of, of you know, engaging with Christianity. It's not solely, you know, and, and a point of view that emerges from Christian construct. How do you engage with those who do not want to engage? How do you engage with those who are so particular about their identity that they are way, it's, you know, they are way on the highway? Um, next further, you talk about religion as we talk about the power in that it's a big human. This color, I think it's a little more. You've got the core you know, religious foundation and text of Islam that are the Quran and the Sunnah, series of, you know, uh, commentary on these foundational texts that, that were almost in inevitably led by men, loads of female scholars that we do not talk about and we've conveniently forgotten. Um, but sorry to all the men. <laughs> Your feminist angst. Um, no, it shouldn't be. Shouldn't be angst. It's reality. It is. Yeah. It is reality. I mean, both the first mosques I I mentioned earlier on. You know, I everybody talks about the men involved in those mosques, mosques of the as the Sheikh of Islam of the British Isles, and I'm going completely off piece now. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten my time as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I couldn't do it before in my past. I don't know whether I can do it now. <laughs> so both of those mosques had women. Liverpool mosque had, had a woman, uh, Lady Fatima Elizabeth Cates, who, who was part of the team that you know founded that mosque, and the working mosque was set up by um, was funded by a Begum, a, a princess, a queen of Bhopal us in, in, in India. Um, we don't remember those. And, and similarly, coming back to the point I was talking about centuries of commentary um, and, and interpretation of Islamic foundational texts, that you know very much were a response to the time and, and to the space in which those commentaries were made. Um, and, and you know, like you talk about you know Christianity, even in Muslim insufficient engagement with you. Know, I keep coming back to this term, the earth and the other, the, the habit society within which these comments were made. We need to consider that in you know our our reflections on text and what within Islam is a human construct, what within Islam is something that was for to it. To, um, Belief uh, you know, I, I, I like you. You make this point about the human term. We consciously en enter into dialogue. You know, a level, a level playing field where right? humanity meets humanity, and it will be right up. Um, calling for modesty and respect on all sides. But is that the kind of dialogue? We are talking about, and you say this is not the the, the stereotypical interfaith dialogue that you know, Sayyid are reminded us what what are the objectives of dialogue, and and I agree. I stated that, and I agree now. Most cases, the encounter with the other is is an objective you know, within itself. I remember a young woman who told me, a young Muslim woman, very hijab, and she she Muslim. To a gentleman at a bus stop, and he asked her why she wore the hijab. And she said, You know, I wear it for this, that, and the other reason. And she said, I am a deist, I am a theist, but I'm also a scientist, I am also a human being. Um, and while they spoke about the theologies of the hijab, that was part of their conversation. They moved on from that quite quickly to talk about the mysteries of the universe so on and so forth and they found a common ground they found a common interest that they were both happy to talk about now whether or not you know this was a constructive relationship they, i don't think they ever met again it was a chance meeting at a bus stop nevertheless a constructive relationship between their you know both their faiths something that could become a point of 
Netflix and you know, in the future they might encounter somebody else from you know each other's tradition or like when you know, they might encounter something about the other's faith in the media and rather than you know, take the stereotypical view often promulgated in the media perhaps take a step back um, and you know and look back on that point of human con uh, human connection and perhaps draw on that human connection to at least critique, at least critically engage, I did briefly with you know stereotypes of, of what is being put forward. Um, I think I have around five minutes. You have about five minutes. Stretch. <laughs> <laughs> um, Two and a half. <laughs> And so, you know, you state here, you know, for whatever reason, you know, when, for whatever reason, we get into conversations about each other's faiths, um, pref preferably within the context of shared endeavors, what we are confronted with are not like this words on the page of propositional truths or self-contained ideas, which only require us to try and understand what they mean. Instead, when you engage in this, you know, dialogue that seeks to establish uh, a relationship that seeks to uh, establish something that is constructive, you go, you go beyond the words. Um, I'm, I'm minded by another young woman, this time a young Muslim woman again, who I interviewed for my research, my PhD research a long time ago. Uh, it was all about feminism, it was all about the commonality of women. Um, and she said to me, oh, I've got nothing in common with Western women, nothing at all. We are I have my values, my really, really important values that shape all aspects of my identity. Um, she then went on to have a baby, um, and then she rings me out of the blue, um, you know, six months or so after I had completed my PhD research work. And she was insistent that I needed to interview her again. And when I incorporate her words into my dissertation, so, you know, then of a PhD in any way managed to negotiate all of that with my then supervisor. I interviewed this young woman again and had a baby, which is, I think, a, a massive, you know, experience in, in most people's lives, mass, you know, life-changing. I have to drive you mad. Um, <laughs> it had had a change on her worldviews, and she said the reason why she wanted me to interview her, again, is she wanted to take back those ideas of being completely different from other you know, on an afternoon with a baby in a buggy. I saw loads of other women with babies in a buggy. I saw loads of dads who were not from my ethnicity, who were not from my religious belief, who had babies in buggies and who were all similar to myself, you know, caring um, of their babies and doing what it needs to, whatever you need to do to bring up a baby, including, you know, throwing up on you and doing all sorts of inhumane things to you. Um, and she found she and in that in that journey in her parenting journey she found a shared value and this shared value had impacted upon her so she wanted to do you know ensure that her previous positionality was corrected in my pieces and over and over again as I engage with people in the context of their own identities you know sociologically engage with them but in the context of interfaith dialogue. And faith, you know, yes, religious faith is important. These are convictions that we people, you know, deeply hold. But, but, but like, you know, what you were saying, Michael, they are, Michael, they are, they are contextual. You know, they're determined by historical constructs. They're determined by values that um, are shared, at least perceptively. And before Paul asks me to stop, I, I think I'll, I'll ask Thank you very much, Michael, for your paper. Thank you. Uh, sorry, it's very hard to do the... Uh, I actually heard everything you said. Oh, That's okay. And I didn't need to shout. <laughs> no, you don't either now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
On that note, we'll see how Jeremy's going to communicate. Okay. <laughs> you have to show them. Do I? Okay. okay. So, um, yeah, you thank you. have to go slowly. I've got to go <laughs> slowly. <laughs> <We're in Valentine. laughs> so anyway, thank you for your paper, Michael. Um, it was a, I thought it was wide ranging. It was interesting, and you've got obviously a lot of extensive experience. That it's not only domestic, but also covered the international arena. Um, I don't have much experience in that, so I'll focus on the elements which have a particular bearing here in the UK. And I, I agree that what you begin with, the dialogue is not possible if Christian participants come from the uh, angle of the sort of church militant using dominance, proselytize the colonial thing. Um, I think I'd go a bit further than that. Uh, I think maybe you only get genuine dialogue in, in a situation where the church or any other dominant religious system uh, has lost sufficient power that it, that it can participate on a level which approaches that of everybody else. Otherwise, he doesn't have the motivation to, to do that, and everybody else is in a sort of supplicant position. See, as a humanist, I agree that Christianity, uh, along with religious and secular convictions, are human constructs, as you, as you say, made up by men and women, largely men, of course. Um, and everyone is seriously looking for truth. Um, made me think of the sort of sea of faith movement, also that, that perspective. Um, however, in this country at least, uh, not only does the Church of England, the established church, have a strong evangelical element, but the Christian groups which are actually growing are, are largely evangelical or Pentecostal. Um, and that can be problem because uh, they obviously would not accept this, this idea of the human construct um, and also not all but many evangelical Christians have a genuine and sincere conviction that's their moral duty to save it, save people by bringing them to Jesus um, and so maybe it's a big ask so to, say, to expect them to turn it off when engaging with non-Christians and maybe that's the reason why they tend not to be very involved in, in dialogue. Um, in talking about the sort of dialogue you, that's most useful, you say, and this is your core point, that um, it isn't a stereotypical interfaith dialogue which you find interesting, but you know it can be a talking shop, and you're looking for things which are much more action <clears throat> um, orientated, based on the human issues we have in common, and that's your, your core thesis. And the particular example you give at the beginning with others. Is the excellent work that the St. Philip Centre in Leicester does. Mm. Um, and no one, I think, can argue with its learning to live well together aim. Eh? Um, um, but for me, I'm not sure. I, I, to me, the, this idea of dialogue and interfaith social action, whatever label you put on it, are not an either or. Indeed, our faith based response is necessarily the best way to address the social issues we face. We've got a complex charity and pressure group ecosystem in this country in which the churches have a legacy of power, organisation, buildings, paid staff and so on, but which also includes all of the secular charities and groups who operate in adjacent and overlapping spaces. And yes, there are examples of joint action between faith and belief groups. You mentioned the environmental campaign as an example. But in practice, it seems to me that a lot of what happens isn't joint. It depends on who is best placed to do the job. You know, I don't have any problem uh, of being an, uh, you know, a supporter of my local trust or trust food bank, as they are effective in doing what they do, and they keep their evangelism sufficiently in check. For me to feel comfortable with that. Uh, but I'm wary of faith groups providing services on behalf of local authority, which is problematic for a lot of reasons. And in other cases, such as the civic response to refugees from war in My local experience has simply been one element of a much larger mix. Uh, dialogue can take many forms, obviously, including all the informal varieties, uh, and Sarah has talked about them. We talked about this extensively. Uh, but I don't think we should dismiss the traditional uh, form, particularly if it can draw in people beyond suspects. And that does have a problem with that, I think. 
it can still have a power of breaking down a, a role of breaking down barriers and humanizing the other. Uh, so I, I think it's still a good thing. Um, Christian aid is one of the cases you cite for uh, examples for action orientation. And obviously, you know, they do a lot of fantastic work around the world as an NGO, along with many other NGOs. Um, but it's interesting that one of the examples was the help they're given to missionary groups to avoid competing with each other. And that fits with one of the strands of thought underpinning what became the World Council of Churches in the form of the quote from, from John's book, may they all be one that the world might believe. Now, I can see that uniting around this is a good idea from the point of view of Chris, Christian ecumenism. But obviously, from my perspective, and also as we've heard from Jackie, making Christian proselytization as opposed to charitable activity, which I know missionaries do, more effective is unlikely to be seen as a desirable outcome by anyone else. And uh, you know, it goes back to the colonizing the world uh, thing being an antithetical to dialogue. So I think we have to be careful about that. Um, the second part of your paper looked at four uh, wider issues. Uh, and the first is the recognition that everybody's response to the discussion, including this one that we're having now, are influenced by history, culture, personality, and all of the other things which we've, we've been talking about. Um, and I think that's similar to the multiple identity issue, which we've also covered before. A subset of that, of course, is tribalism and, uh, you know, <coughs> I want to see how distractive uh, that can be. So I particularly like the sentence you have, which is, it is not just a matter of debating what is said, but of being sensitive to the human complexities involved when people speak and what might be called the beauty of the words they use. I think that's very helpful. Second point you talk about values. Um, I, you know, I think this is of core importance. So you, you raise this question about can a value uh, uh, such as equal respect as the example there, survive, cut loose from the faith statement, uh, such as man is made in the image of God. What's the justification for a value? Do you need That reminded me of a discussion I had with a young Muslim who was dismissive of the concept of human rights on the basis that they have no foundation. In contrast, the ethical code provided by directly by God in the Quran and I tried to argue it doesn't matter whether we agree on justification, but what matters is the way we behave towards each other and the human rights framework codifies the way that that should work, irrespective of religion and philosophy. Sadly, we, we just went round and round, we couldn't agree. While I can see the case for avoiding this sort of by, a, a problem by focusing on practical issues, um, where there are real differences in that, I think they do need to be recognized and, if possible, addressed. And obviously, dialogue should involve good disagreement as well as agreement. Um, but perhaps just thinking about this, the, the question of justification really only needs to come into play when there is disagreement about values and when exploration is needed to get down to these forces. In the other cases, maybe we can just agree and move on and say move on to action. I thought in the context of values, you say that one thing Christians can't do in the public square is to suggest that certain values must be upheld for reasons tied to their particular Christian faith. And you, that's what I mean by moving the roost or claiming privilege. Now, I would say that it's illustrated by the debate on assisted dying, where we really, indeed, we really hear the argument that human life is a gift from God and only he can decide when to take it away. Instead, the focus is on points about life with old people, old people, slippery slopes, and, and so on. I can see there's a good pragmatic reason for doing this, because a faith-based argument won't persuade anyone who doesn't adhere to that faith. But it can easily tip over into a sort of disingenuous category. Um, and that's a, that's a worry sometimes. Can you just say a bit more about that? By saying, no, 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 it's not, I've got the... the Denying the, the reality of what the reason Your third point is about the limitations of faith when it comes to issues such as the practical implementation of social policy, where other dis uh, disciplines are needed to make it work. Interesting, I would say, ironically, you say that Christianity doesn't know how best to run a school. Well, that's quite contentious. 
uh, as Christian churches very much insist that they know how best to run schools in this country. And the third of state schools are run by them. And so this comes back to this issue of secularism. Um, and uh, especially one which is, is in a secular society, especially one that's predominantly non-religious, but has also got an unprecedented diversity of places. How do we balance the clear rights of Christians and their leaders to express issues or their views on issues of the day? And I would strongly defend their rights to do that versus the need to avoid still claiming privilege problem that you rightly highlight. Uh, the presence that we still have 26 unelected Anglican bishops in the House of Lords suggests we're still firmly in the claiming privilege territory, I think. Um, the dialogue may have a role in resolving this sort of issue. Um, but history, for example, in the issue of gay rights, shows that it usually takes something more than dialogue, muscular, to actually affect change. So in summary, I take your point about the limitations of traditional dialogue and of the value of actions rather than words. But I think there is added value for people from different backgrounds getting together and getting to know each other, humanizing the other uh, anyway especially if it can be widened beyond the usual suspect. I think that's a good thing. And it may be the only thing done with the resources available in some cases. So I don't think we should dismiss it. Alternative to the social action that you're talking about. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, Jeremy. I uh, begin also um, with this paper um, expressing my gratitude for the uh, clarity with which it was written and um, I was especially uh, grateful that you acknowledged that elephant in the room of the um, the, the desire the, the triumphalist nature of Christianity in wishing to convert us um, and here I would just stress um, that in fact in Judaism there is no great desire to convert other people. In fact, we tell people three times to go away when they approach us. So you know, it, it isn't that, uh, as was stated earlier, that there was a lesser degree of desire to convert to Judaism. We, it isn't there. Uh, we do it, um, but not. We don't go seeking. Um, so I'm grateful you mentioned that. And. Um, just to stress that this is a very difficult uh, issue for us Jews. Um, I remember just before COVID, uh, the before and the after, uh, taking a group of young people to an exhibition in um, uh, one of the cathedrals in, in London, I won't name it, um, where they were having an interfaith um, exhibition of uh, panels uh, illustrating um, a thought um, that you should love your neighbour as you love yourself, uh, which comes in various uh, guises across different religions. And um, in that, uh, the Christian one, um, they had chosen to illustrate Moses with a statue from Michelangelo, um, which shows uh, Moses with horns, uh, which is, of course, a, a, a mistranslation of the Hebrew and the total misunderstanding, but based on a traditional view that, that Jews are less than human, uh, that we are demons of some kind or another. Mm -hmm. And I found that very difficult to try and tell this to the 13 and 14 year olds that I had with me, um, who really could not cope with this. So I'm grateful that you mentioned it, because it is actually a really important question. Uh, the second thing I would um, like to mention is this business of, um, of, of values. Um, values are really dependent, unfortunately, on historical and other contexts, which you, I'm sure, are aware. Just to give you an example of this, um, I was invited a few weeks ago to Saudi Arabia. I couldn't believe it. I went to Saudi Arabia. I was amazed. Yes, I, I asked my Muslim friends whether I could go or not, uh, being aware of you know, various um, other things going on in Saudi Arabia. Um, and they all said, well, it's better to have a bridge than not. So I went. I, mean, I was treated like a, I don't know what it was. 
ah, the hospitality was unbelievable. Right. You were taking in by the way. No. <laughs> <laughs> I must be joking. I'm a cynic when it comes to things like that. Um, and, and my cynicism was 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 fed. Um, I believe in the motivation of the guy who organized the conference. Um, why did I believe it? Because I was speaking to an American who's writing his um, biography. And he said, well, look, I wouldn't have got involved in writing this biography if I didn't believe in this guy, um, because my wife was killed in 9-11. And I would not be involved with this if I didn't think that this particular guy was the general secretary of the Muslim World League. I think I've got that right, Muslim World League. Um, who wishes to um, promote moderation in religions. Um, and, you know, and, and that's a wonderful thing, and it's great, and he's spending millions on it around the world. It's amazing what this guy, and um, my cynicism there, I think, was misspent, um, misplaced when I spoke to this guy doing the, the biography, because, you know, I, I trusted that, um, what this guy said. But some of the speakers, um, you know, values are understood differently, I think, is the it, by different societies. So, um, you know, when you get uh, people speaking from certain countries, stressing how open their society is and how, um, uh, how they welcome other religions and other thoughts and points of view, and you're aware of what goes on and views, then there is a clash. And the only way I could understand this clash was that they understood those words in a different way, if that makes sense. That how I understood the value of openness and, and, and welcoming different religions was obviously different to the way that they understood it, because I'm trying not to be too simple. Um, and there was one person in the afternoon who spoke on a panel on human dignity. And basically his, his message was, with contraception, abortion, homosexuality and women's rights, there is no, no place for human dignity because there will be no humans. Um, now, obviously he understood that phrase in a totally different manner to me. Um, and, and so I wasn't taken in, but I did try to be generous in my understanding of how people could make these statements, though I wouldn't accept them, of course, at all. Um, so when we talk about having common values, which was what at the end of the conference, which only took, you know, we're about five hours or something, I must tell you. Um, they produced this long declaration which talked about common values, seeking common values between different peoples. And you know, that's you know, motherhood and apple pie. That's great. But what was obvious to me, listening to the speakers, was that the understanding of what common values are, right? And, and, and that wasn't there, it wasn't present. So, you know, to me, there is a certain danger. Um, and the other thing I would just stress is that this whole process of dialogue, however we do it, whether it's over cups of tea or whether it's in these wonderful projects or in the deeper levels of, of theology can only work. Um, there's, there's a prayer in our synagogues which talks about um, toleration. And I have various members of my congregation who jump up and down and say, don't like the word toleration. We have to have respect and not only respect, but celebrate differences. And I must admit, I agree with them, um, but it's very difficult to ignore the word because everybody's following the prayer. Um, but some people do, in fact, I sound a bit desperate, don't I? Um, but some people, of course, do change the word. And I can't stress enough how, um, none of these beautiful things that you talk about will work without that respect and celebrating the difference and to do that you need to acknowledge difference thank you
So, deep breath, Michael. Well, I was hoping that you would go on a bit longer <laughs> to organize anything here. But thank you, all of you. Um, useful. Um, I think the most important point is we've got another form of dialogue, which is not cup of tea dialogue, but bus stop dialogue. Is that right? <laughs> so you can define that in yet another yes. journal volume form. Um, <laughs> The, the point, uh, I think you, you raise this issue about a triumphalist Christianity. Um, I mean, I was trying to say, I mean, it may be very theoretical, but it has been very practical that for much of its history, that's how Christianity has seen itself. Mm. And as I do, you go regularly, I go regularly to church on Sunday. And uh, even this Sunday, they sang an extraordinarily triumphalist hymn. Um, so expressions of it, even if I think they don't any longer mean it, go on. And in other areas, such as when somebody said some Christians find it their duty to convert other people to their faith, that kind of syndrome goes on. And, and if it's really taken seriously, then there isn't any point in, in talking, you know. Um, so I just acknowledge that that, 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 is, a, that is a fact there. Um, the, the interesting one for me was when you talked about the Muslim woman who sort of moderated her views when she was pushing a pram with a lot of other women. What I heard originally was she was saying, look, I, I'm a Muslim woman and out of my faith I have my values. And here are all these, let's say, Westerners who are often charged these days in the debate as becoming pure relativists, or they say, oh, anything goes. See? Um, and I often want to defend the word relativism because I think it's right, it's rightly used when, when you say people's not only their values, but their beliefs and many things are relative stroke contingent to all kinds of things. If, if their history changes, their personality changes, their experience changes, these things are liable to moderate, if not change. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a, a proper way of using, for me, the word relative, because this, this particular conviction I have is in fact relative to the context in which I find myself, historical, social, or whatever. What is bad about it is that people then say, oh, relativists, you know, they have no kind of um, ways of um, saying, well, this is a better value or a better conviction than this one. Because although those exercises can never be absolutely completed, there are, you know, there are kind of um, checks that you can make as to whether you value that particular view or that particular view. To say it's relative, is not to say you can't make any kind of judgment between them. You know, one obviously you would do is be to appeal very carefully, as scientists would, to what we observe, both about us and within us. How far does it check up with that? You know, another one is how many people over the ages have taken it seriously, which doesn't mean it's right, but it's at least a fact to be reckoned with. How many of the, the literatures, some of us would call them sacred texts, you know, also agree with this or don't. There are many, many ways of saying they're all relative, but that doesn't mean they're all on a level. Mm -hmm. And I think relativism is cast as a slur very often in a way that's, that's not carefully enough used. So I thought at one point, you know, she saw a bit of that. Um, but, but what you then said, you know, she changed her mind. There we are again, you change your mind because you find yourself in a different context. However, thank you. <laughs> Jeremy. Um, you said, I mean, I think you made some reference to the church militant, did you not? And that only dialogue gets possible where faith has lost its power or faith institutions have lost their power. I mean, whether that's true or not, and it's probably true, um, it, it, which you didn't, I thought you were going to pick up actually, because I was quite interested in the issue of power. Thank you, later on in the paper touching on it here. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, um, it actually came up, is this, is this still Monday or not? Yes, it came up actually on the um, start of the week at nine o'clock this morning, the issue of power. In the present disputes, you know, where people say, um, oh, all this trouble's being caused by left-wing radicals in the transport unions and so on and so forth. It's actually basically causing the trouble for the people who have structures, etc. The issue of power came out extraordinarily clearly this morning. And it, it must be a very serious issue in dialogue. Um, and even if you're trying to teach a group of students, as we've all tried to do in universities, there's an issue of power here. So insofar as you raise it again, you know, I, I want to emphasize it and hope we can discuss it. Uh, yeah, this, this business, uh, you then said, you know, that the evangelicals, incidentally, I think you're right in this country where, if you want to call it Christianity, is growing. It is amongst the evangelicals, the Pentecostalists, and also the uh, parachurch movement. Is that won't identify straight away with any mainstream church, including Pentecostalists and mm -hmm. evangelicals as such. And they're very much community oriented. You know, they have some kind of worship and religious stuff, but they're very community oriented. But you're right, that it, where it's growing in this country, which again is an interesting question for analysis as to why. But that would be for another day. But what I wanted to say here, um, you pick up something that we always kind of semi, well, semi-serious about the missionaries, especially the medical missionaries. They used to say they got people into beds and tried to heal them in order that they could convert them making a similar charge about people who might be doing worthy things in the community, but under sort of hidden agenda, or they want to convert. Of which, of course, we all disapprove. But just go carefully, because one of the features of the evangelical community in the Christian churches in this country it's of course they want to make people Christians. They would never question that. And, you know, I was Christian aid and I was working with Tear Fund. Tear Fund are overtly evangelical. They don't call themselves a development agency. They call themselves a missionary agency, or they used to. Right? Um, so, of course, that's there. But also there is and has been revived in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, a huge social conscience amongst the evangelical Christians. As far as I can see, um, has a kind of continuity with their faith and has a discontinuity because they want to work for justice, peace, whatever you want to call it, irrespective of whether the people they work with and for become Christians or not. So we have to be a bit careful about assuming that everybody who's got a kind of evangelical faith uh, and is doing good works is doing them for an ulterior motive. And remember, that most of us do things that seem to be good for very mixed motives in any case. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of the mainstream churches who are busy being interested in the community and they're hoping to save their institutions. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the evangelicals then. Uh, oh yes, that was that. Um, you, you keep telling me, because I shouldn't dismiss the kind of more traditional forms of dialogue, I accept that piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> but what you need to know, it's not a matter of me judging what's valuable. It's a matter of me being honest where I get interested. And, uh, you know, I have taken I have taken part in what you would say. It's just not what you're talking about. <coughs> totally disinterested. But when I get into situations like I've described in the paper, where you're involved with communities that are hugely diverse, interfaith, inter, uh, ethnic diversity, but together are involved in these huge social questions and injustices. You know, then they start talking to one another and they indeed talk about the case. Then I get interested. But not in the rather disconnected one, which I know you're not guilty of. <laughs> <laughs>
but I saw accept your advice, but not completely. <laughs> um, I think I, I, it was a bit of failure of communication when you got, not with you, but with me, about Christian aid, World Council of Churches. Um, you, you painted the picture, which I may have misled you, that the, the ecumenical movement, which was you know, an effort to stop churches quarreling with one another and work together, which is not a bad thing to try and do. But one of the, one of the initial pushes for that was that the, the missionaries realized that what they were doing all over Africa and Asia, simply importing into Africa and Asia all their divisions. And it was, it had a really, I think, acceptable moral side to this, that they should not be doing that. So it wasn't that they divided it up in order to be more effective. They divided it up into stop importing their quarrels into other people's societies. Okay, um, and um, so and you know, <laughs> you I quoted John's gospel um, that they may all be one that the world may believe, which is constantly quoted still in the week of prayer for Christian unity, which is distinctly on the way. Um, and people interpret that, the argument being, if Christians are seen to be united and not quarreling, then the world will be much more impressed and will kind of join the Christian faith as a result. Um, whereas, a bit like politicians say, no, nobody, nobody votes for a divided party. Right? Now, I think there was a bit of that around, but it's certainly not around now. Um, what should be around now is that if Christians don't have some internal integrity, they don't deserve to be taken much notice of. But we've long since thought that by getting into one church, we'll convert the rest of the world. I mean, that's a pretty, you know, uh, arrive. And of course, generally now, there's much less, I think, amongst my enlightened circles, uh, there's much less attraction to the idea of one Christian church. I think it's quite a dangerous idea now, as I used to think it was quite a good idea. Yeah. Stop quarreling, work together, but for God's sake, don't create one enormous, terrible institution. Uh, values, um, can they survive? Well, this is the discussion we're having, isn't it? And I don't think I'm just going to repeat myself here. There is a question about, and there's a long tradition in philosophy and moral philosophy about can you have a value unless it's rooted in something. And the version it often takes is, can you have an ought without an is? Can there be a moral obligation that isn't somehow rooted in a reality to which it gives rise? So the obvious, one obvious example in Christian thought is, we're, therefore there's a moral value in respecting everybody as human beings. So I'm only saying that discussion goes on and it bemuses me uh, no moral theory seems to me to be satisfactory about what is the basis for a moral value. Uh, so I sort of come back to, I think, what you were saying, that what we do is struggle to agree on a moral value that we can then work together. You know, that you establish it by agreement, much more by what's it rooted in and how is it justified in a rather theological sense. Okay. Um, Oh, Christianity does not know how best to run a school, but then Jeremy adds, but you're all busy running them. Um, well, that doesn't alter my argument one bit, really. I mean, we have a debate about faith schools, which generally I do not approve of. Um, but I don't think it, what I'm saying is that there's nothing in Christianity, what we call the autonomous disciplines, which I think Muslim social thinkers also aspire to to some extent um, that if you're going to establish a social policy which may be an educational policy for sake of the argument there is no direct line from well here's my christian faith so that's yeah, what the policy should that. be yes. so there's the intermediary <laughs> disciplines yeah. so that's what i'm talking yeah. about right yeah. so if i don't take account of the educationalist of the sociologist in developing it then i'm being rather foolish so that's mm -hmm. what i meant Then to come, value, I mean, you, your discussion again comes back to this, what's the root of the values? But the other one, just to finish off with, was 
they all they all sign up to um what did you say um yeah but i was trying to think of an example they, they all signed up to um what, what was the, what are the values you said human dignity yeah that's right uh, something you know so, so then when you get away from it you think well what did they mean because um you know some people think human dignity is being pretty heavy about how you treat women for example you know safe you're looking after them all this sort of stuff i just wanted to say that the other problem is um the off-quoted area of agreement morally things like love your neighbor as yourself which get repeated in other religions even in different forms and even in a secular one do unto others as you yeah. would do to them um they like your no no your no addict things you've got five no addict yeah. laws yeah. seven no addict laws oh, i've never heard seven. of them before seven so i was educated yeah. on that yeah. Yeah. to be modest yeah. i was educated all over the place but i admit to that one um <laughs> there's so much question begging that goes on within these things we think that we agree about you're putting it in the way we think we're saying the same thing but we're not it's no good saying love your neighbor until you start saying what do you mean by loving your neighbor you know, you know, I'm not saying you don't, but I'm just saying that it, it's about the question begging nature, you know, the old one about the old, uh, Ten Commandments, you know, um, sort of uh, thou shalt not murder or thou shalt not kill. It's question begging, you know, because murder has already said illegitimate killing, but killing which survives in your nomadic things. All of these are question begging until you begin to ask, well, what does actually somebody mean when they say that? And then you start having a discussion again. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it, it's good to have those extra issues now on the table. And um, I was just thinking, you know, Michael, you said uh, now you're worshiping in an Anglican church, you become kind of more conscious. But in one sense, it, uh, it struck me in Jeremy's thing about bishops in the House of Lords, oh, yes. schools and so on, that actually there are other strands of Christian tradition which have never accepted these things, mm -hmm. actually, or at least fundamentally so, though many contemporary, for example, Baptists are quite comfortable or become comfortable with it, that historically um, uh, yeah. there were people who led passive resistance campaigns to paying for church rates, uh, you know, Baptist ministers and so on. So um, it can be easy to look at the dominant form or what historically has been the dominant form of Christianity structurally in terms of England, the established church, but that doesn't necessarily mean all other forms of Christians are in support of it. And uh, we're definitely <coughs> against Anglican bishops in the House of Lords. We just want a few Baptists. <laughs> but, 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 so, you know, and, and speaking for myself, I'm kind of sympathetic to your argument about only as power is eroded in one sense that can one. On the other hand, I think there is an argument that is advanced by Anglicans, and I think that, you know, there's something to be heard in it that there's. You know, the kind of establishment, which they would argue is now becoming a soft one, actually enables uh, some kind of interaction between religion. The way that in secular societies of the version of France or something doesn't happen in the public sphere, that it's by the foothold in the public sphere that that gate is opened up. And often it's the case that actually minority religious figures often support that whether or not they should, um, but certainly in the past, various chief rabbis have said, this is why it's a good thing to have an established church in England, and so on. But I think it's an intra-Christian debate in this society and, and beyond. And, you know, uh, you, yeah, I mean, yeah. you're venturing, as you do, interestingly <laughs> widely. Um, there's one argument happening in state religion. Mm -hmm. um, there's another argument, therefore, you've got bishops. You yes, know, in the House of Lords. Yeah. But, I mean, your your way of saying it does to some extent ensure some kind of interaction between mm. a faith community and whatever the political world. Yeah. Mm. That can be just as well, if not better established, if you like the House of Lords, by the selection process 
that makes sure the House of Lords is representative of the community it's supposed to represent, yes. which will mean it'll have a, a significant proportion of Jews and Muslims and Christians and humanists or atheists, whichever mood you happen to be in. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, no. And indeed, indeed, some years ago, I actually decided to give, I gave evidence to the Commission on Reform of the House of Lords um, in Birmingham, chaired by an Anglican bishop, <laughs> but uh, where I was making precisely this argument, if you're going to have an unelected body, then at least make it reflective of the, of the nature of, of society. Um, but yeah. And one other brief thing out of that, and the discussion on values, uh, one thing I've tried in the past, I don't know whether it helps or not, to because people feel kind of fundamentally about values, but you can get into either not taking another person's values seriously, but if you focus on values outcomes, what are the values outcomes, that's the territory in which maybe it's possible to to use a kind of political you word, negotiate. To, yeah, well, negotiate, but you do come up to, with the unintended consequences. The ability to actually, you, you may predict your intention, yeah. what the outcome is, but to predict what will be the outcome. No, you can't. It's very difficult. You can't. It's you an know. open territory, and that's a yeah. scary territory. Yeah, so it's, again, difficult to yeah. justify. Yeah. But you can so, talk about an intent. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I think that's important. So, Anthony, I'm not sure whether it's your hand this time or the mediating hand of the. Uh, yeah, it's a mediate hand. So, a question from Dr. Matt Beach, who's online. So, uh -huh. uh, so Matt, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm in California at the minute, so I've been oh. joining you from 4 a.m. So it's, um, That's I, bob there. I bobbed off to get a few cups of tea. So um, <laughs> anyway, I've got a few comments. And uh, so Michael, thanks for your paper. In a way, Michael, I thought when I was in the room uh, with you a couple of weeks ago, I actually thought your paper could be entitled Humanists and Dialogue Part Two, because I thought it kind of was very much hand in glove in many ways with, with Jeremy's. I mean, my question is, where is the Christ in your Christians and Dialogue? And maybe, maybe you've answered it when you said, with your opening comment when you said about sort of ag agnostic kind of Christianity, but I just wondered where is the, where where and what is the Christ in your Christians and dialogue? I think that's kind of a, a foundational question, really, because I think that necessarily determines um, where you sit will necessarily determine where you uh, where, where you kind of uh, you go on the journey, really. So that's my first question. I guess the other thing I wanted to say is that I think. Forgive me if I'm, this is not directly at Michael. I think toleration really matters. Toleration is a really helpful thing in open and free plural societies because what toleration requires of us is that we do dignify each other from different traditions, yet we don't make any commitment to accept our um, or embrace our differences. And I think that's really important because toleration is, that, is the heartbeat of dialogue. It's not saying I'm going to come and I'm going to embrace you. And actually, it's not saying I'm going to leave that conversation actually not wanting to try and persuade you. Persuasion has to be part. And that's why I don't think we should, you know, be all downbeat on the Muslims and the Christians that want to proselytize. You just do it in a peaceable, respectful, conversational way to, to say to people uh, you shouldn't proselytize is to say to them you shouldn't be Muslim or you shouldn't be Christian in a, in a properly in a properly basic sense, I think. Now, you can kind of liberalize it or secularize it and explain it away if you want. But really, Christianity and Islam uh, and in very early forms of Judaism as well was were, were faiths. And I'm a historian, political science, not a theologian, so I'm sure others will correct me. Our faith were faith that sought to share. So dialogue has to have a space for persuasion. It's just, but the thing what we want is we want everyone to do that in a in a peaceable conversational way. And my last point, and I'll shut up because I've been listening for hours and hours. So I wanted to say a few things, so forgive me. My last thing I think is we and this comes back to Michael. We are we are really on that sticky position again that if we want, and I said this at I don't know, I can hear something in the background. Um, it, going on. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I wonder if it's going to get me to that. Go, go on, go on, we're listening. 
Um, the last, we, we can't really get away from the problem that the concrete values and the concrete policy outcomes people want to talk about and that Michael wanted to talk about in his paper can't be, can't be apprehended without um, a clear objective standard. Uh, so you have to have a clear objective moral standard uh, but you know, and an account of that if you're going to have clear objective values. We can't have concrete values like social justice if there is no account of a just judge. We cannot have concrete values such as um, sustainability unless there's a clear concrete account of a, cre a creator who gives us his creation to sustain and, and be guardians of. Okay, so thanks so much everyone. I've really enjoyed it. Cheers. Are you going away before I reply? I'm no, sir. No, I'll be here, but just I'll be silent and obedient. <laughs> I wish I could say the same about me. But, um, just to take your middle point, I I I, I agree about that. Um, I, in fact, I was going to raise it. Um, I got so many confused notes, but I think we do need to talk about when we have dialogue where what place persuasion has in it yeah. mm -hmm. because there isn't a serious conversation that isn't trying to persuade mm -hmm. but that's a different thing from a kind of hidden agenda that my purpose is you know to to win someone over to some faith to proselytize in that sense and it is a different thing persuasion is a different thing from you, I've got to persuade you into my position because my position is right. Now, I'm not serious in a dialogue unless I have some conviction. But as I've said all along through my paper, you've got to marry in maturity conviction and commitment on the one hand with a real self-awareness and scepticism on the other hand. Those two things have to go together. So that's just a bit about the persuasion. But of course, there has to be a persuasive element for a conversation to be serious. You know, and you have just committed that crime yourself. Um, <laughs> now, it's very unfair of you to ask me in this context, where, where is Christ and all that? Because I need everybody to disperse and come together again for a couple of hours this evening. Um, don't laugh, that's right. But I make a distinction. I'm not defending this position, but I'm just telling you my position. I make a distinction between the Christ and the Christian myth, which I outlined crudely at the beginning of my paper, and which took over from the original drive of the movement in the early first century. Uh, Christianity gave way to the myth of the Christ, the God who is incarnate, who dies to save us. That is the Christian myth. Where I cling on to my Christianity, and I'm there mainly as a sense of belonging, where I come on is the Christ of the Gospels, the Jesus of the Gospels. Now, don't come back and tell me that that's just as difficult and complex as the other one. I know that. See? But I call myself not a believer, but a follower. Um, and I could, I'm trying to write about it, but... That's just a signal to you. I've got something to say in reply to your distant challenge. Um, and I, I don't think I understand your last point. Uh, I don't think you can have objective moral values. But I think that's a subject for, and it's coming back to what we're all talking about, values are the basis for values. Uh, I may be very clear, and as a community, we may be very clear that we have adopted a moral value, but it's not an objective one. And that comes back to some of the things you were saying. It's certainly not an objective one. But that's for a longer persuasive conversation. <laughs> There's also a question from Professor Paul Bibbitt. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes. Um... It's difficult to hear all the discussion, um, but um, from what I've gleaned from it, one question which seems to be emerging all the time is, what is dialogue actually for? And uh, one answer I've heard this afternoon, which I think is a very good one, is that it's for mutual understanding. And that kind of mutual understanding leads to love of the neighbor 
and various forms of justice and lack of conflict. Uh, that, that, that reason, I think, has come out really quite clearly. Um, I'd like to add another reason that I haven't heard come out quite the same way, and I do it from the perspective of a Christian believer. That is, I don't think I understand my own faith until I have heard the story of other people's faith, or lack of faith, indeed, the humanist perspective. Uh, I, I don't think that I understand my worldview properly, one which is going to be productive for my life and the life of others, until I've heard that. And it's partly to do with a theological conviction about where God is present in the world. So as well as mutual understanding, I, I'd want to say that, that I think there is a, a very strong reason for dialogue in, in self-understanding and indeed understanding of one's own faith. One cannot understand one's own faith without, in fact, listening to the stories of other people's faith and, and lack of faith. I don't understand the person of Christ, I think, without listening uh, to those stories. So that, that, as it were, is a distinctively um, theological perspective that I'd like to put in, was I don't think I've heard that said this afternoon, but it might be because um, I think I've only heard about 40 to 50 percent of, <laughs> of what has actually been said. But, but what I have heard, I've heard with, with great gratitude. But I don't know if anyone wants to respond to that, Michael, for, for example, was that what I'm putting forward is a version of Christianity, I think, which is not quite the same as the version that he gave at the beginning of, of his paper, which was really a very exclusive view, though no doubt historically correct, but it doesn't have to be the only view of Christianity. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's the second point, and you did make it um, last time we were talking, um, which, which I agree with. I mean, surely my understanding of a faith that is um, relative contingent, it grows up in certain circumstances, uh, leaves my position wide open and very happy to be open that other versions of Christianity can be developed. So I don't have any problems with that all at all. Um, and I hope that I and you have developed and many others a more inclusive form of Christianity. Mm. But nevertheless, um, traditionally, um, and still if you repeat the creeds, and blah, 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 um, it can be heard as a very universal and triumphalist faith. Um, your first point, I think, to be fair to Jeremy, unless I'm mishearing, I think you said in your paper that there was, within dialogue, one of the purposes was self-understanding and self-awareness. Am I not right? So I'm going to get out from under and tell you to answer Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, if I, yeah, I, I wanted to say that's from a particularly religious perspective. I mean, I, I understand uh, Jeremy saying that, and I uh, also, you know, completely agree with that and sympathise with it. I just wanted to make clear that it, that you could say the same thing from a religious perspective. That was the point I was making. Yeah. Yeah. So I think an interesting thing, if, if I can maybe illustrate it by an example for me, then in a way, I guess you're advising to do Paul. Um, as a Christian, um, I've often struggled with, from being a teenage Christian evangelical onwards, you know, what does the cross mean? You know, I've never been comfortable with any of the theories, uh, the theological theories of the cross. But one thing that did really illuminate something perhaps of a meaning, at least, because I know also I quoted earlier my Jewish woman friend's perception of the cross, crossing my ancestors out <laughs> in this fine conquer. Um, but one example I did have was when a Muslim friend of mine, after attending a particular service of Christian worship, said to me, they thought they'd understood something about the cross for the first time and ask the question of themselves as a Muslim, why do we Muslims always have to win? And that as a question from a Muslim reacting to the cross made me perhaps have some sense of what, you know, an inheritance in this theological thing, 
the cross, what that might mean. It's we don't always have to win. But, but the cross, but, the theories do always have to win. But then, of course, there is the resurrection. I know, but <laughs> yes. But I think well, it's my little example, in my little uh, sense, really. So, sorry. Um, it, it's more, it's sort of more damaging. I'm trying to sort of string some thoughts together and hopefully it will make sense. But, but thank you very much, Paul, for your, for your comments. And I was thinking about you know, somebody who is a, a, a practicing Muslim. You know, Jeremy was wondering whether I, I sort of align with liberal identity. I'm as, I'm as strict as they get, Jeremy, so, you know, fire and brimstone hidden underneath. But as, as somebody who is, you know, decently practicing, who believes and who, you know, wears her belief, not on her sleeve, but on, on her head, um, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I do. And, and as a believing Muslim, I think particularly given where you know, Islam features on this so-called trajectory of Abrahamic faiths. I think it is almost in on, on Muslim belief to understand Christianity and Islam in order to make better sense of, of their own faith. And again, thinking about the Quran as a scripture, um, and those of you who engage with the Quran, it isn't one of those, it doesn't tell you the story consistently, it doesn't have a beginning and an end. Instead, it draws upon various stories that are shared and revered by, you know, in biblical and, and Jewish tradition. Coming from and, and the need to understand the other, in, you know, in order to better understand one's own faith. And that is something that is theological, but I also think that is something that is sociological. And as, as we consolidate our sense of identity, as we consolidate, you know, what was it you say that who said your Muslimness wasn't sort of identity characteristic one, but that, that often gets assigned as your identity characteristic? So as we try to make sense of these you know, political, social um, dynamics that A, impact upon our own you know, thought processes around identity and, and how we perceive ourselves, as well as the mechanisms that straight jacket us into particular you know, straight jacket us under particular labels. So I think what you're talking about is you know, applicable and, and, and useful uh, there as well. I had a final reflection on the idea of you know, disconnected reflection on the idea of toleration. And I know it is it is often said in interfaith circles, but I just have to repeat it again. I think toleration isn't enough. Toleration and replicate power dynamics that minoritize particular groups, um, particular, you know, and, and, and in European traditions, Jews and Christians and other minoritized faiths bear the brunt of, you know, having to be tolerated. And so I think we need to move away from ideas of toleration towards ideas of respect. This does not mean that, you know, we conform and agree with everything that the other says, but they at least have a space that they can have their values. We have ours. You, know, you have your theologies, we have ours, and we agree to disagree. And I think that point of respect is much more worthy than um, toleration. Time for one more contribution in the room. From the room. So I have to pick up on this idea of the of the proselytization <clears throat> and the stress caused to groups, particularly Jews, um, humanists, in terms of this whole sort of monolithic Christendom with its power structures and its triumphalism. Now, I've been a pastor in a church for many years, and my average congregant won't share the gospel because of fear of being victimized, ostracized, or rejected by those very people who seem to fear. <laughs> and I'm sort of thinking, well, practically on the ground, Christendom is kind of still there a bit in structures, but in the people, in congregations, probably in churches, probably in mosques, there's a fear of actually proselytizing. And I'm wondering if that can actually be useful in terms of saying actually that idea of 
they're out to get us is not really there anymore, even though they would desire that you embrace their faith. So that I can start. So Dr. Ramsey. <laughs> Sorry, we're friends yeah, from the that group I was talking about. Yes, Dr. Ramsey and part of Oxford, Oxford, Imam Oxford University, and Oxford Jewish University. But what we have, my brother, we have talked many times, of course, you know, um, uh, of revelation is, is a part of the Christianity and Islam. Missionary to be a missionary is a part of it. You cannot, you cannot uh, make it uh, go away. Um, we haven't got any other religion. I don't believe, of course, Judaism has. Or, but uh, uh, that too is a missionary religion. And yeah, I suppose it is. There's this kind of a difference of feel about. Uh, you've got. You've got. I'm going to tell you about my Christian faith because you all share it, <coughs> right? That sort of thing. And uh, sharing, sharing things with people. That I think I've got something valuable to share. It's not the whole thing there is to share. Other people have got things, but to move around people and share, I mean, you know, there are rare occasions when I find I'm completely comfortable in talking with somebody else about things that mean so much that I start to cry. Uh, I don't think there's anything offensive in that. But I profoundly find it offensive if somebody comes to me and say, well, look, this is what it is. And you, you know, I've got to try and make you share it. It's just a totally different feel about it. I mean, it's directed towards me in a sense of all this. Um, I'm not trying to be antagonistic. I understand totally. I, I, I feel the respect. <laughs> 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 um, but it's, um, you know, I, I, I have no difficulties having deep conversations with my friends and colleagues about their faith. And I, um, somebody on, on, on the screen call, I think it was, was saying, what's the point of it religiously? And yes, I agree with him. Um, Part of dialogue means that I have to research and think about my own faith, because without having that, I can't engage. But part of it for me has been that I've learned things about faith from other people. Yeah. Um, and the values of certain practices or thoughts, which I have been um, really quite humble at accepting and thinking that this is actually useful in, in my own religious way in my own religious life, and that's great. Um, and I'm very happy when that happens with a group of people. But I think it was you who said, because you, you, know, you, you engage in such talk when you have a group that you have become friendly with and have, you know, what I object to very strongly, and it's happened to me on so many occasions, uh, where Christians or Muslims have tried to say to me, um, you know, we are superior, I mean, we don't use those terms, but we're superior, we know the way to God, uh, you're old fashioned, you know, you're the old lot, um, you, you, you come on, come on board, you know, get on to the new lot, get on to our, 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 our better spiritual path, and that is, is well, it's just offensive now, um, but in the past has been incredibly dangerous. I it's good to have someone from that group. <laughs> Sheikh Ramsey knows I'm 100% true to my faith. He's 100% yeah, true to his faith. We have some lovely conversations. Well, absolutely. And that's, that, that is what one of the best. Wow. And we've gone into schools together and spoken yeah. to youngsters as friends and colleagues. Right. I think that, that illustrates the, the key difference, doesn't it? Yeah. That you can have. Have very challenging interchange and you have you know, great arguments about things and, and those often uh, you know very fulfilling but you're doing it on the basis that you're sure you're confident in where you're, <coughs> yeah. your your face is not going to be changed by those arguments and you're 
Hashem is saying, you're a star, I'm not going to be changed by that. But it may be honed down. You might think, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, and that's absolutely. Point, you know? And I think that was my humanism. But, you know, the Dalai, you know, humanist love argument. Is, no respect, of course, again, again with, with our good, um, uh, um, I've been 40 years doing the, uh, doing the missionaries all over the world here and everywhere else in the world. But uh, um, I've never seen anybody say uh, your religion is better than mine. I always, everybody says my religion doesn't matter. Many, Chris said, doesn't matter anything. He says my religion is the best. I respect your religion, I respect your religion, but I. Uh, a missionary for my religion. Therefore, we cannot say, of course, uh, um, come, come to say, um, I can't say my religion is the best. Is if we can't, we can't, uh, you know, I, I, even I can't, I can't imagine with all respect, of course, I've been all over, all over, I'm, I'm head of the interface of several organizations, but I always said, my God is there and I love my religion and my religion is best. <laughs> but, but this is what I say with the, with the sincerity. And of course, um, I, I remember the Bishop, uh, well, Archbishop uh, um, Bruce, he was saying it's exactly the same. He says, I love to give my religion to you. I know, I know you love to give your religion to me because you think it's the best. So that's why we were working together. Yeah. This was a way. He said, I offer you that, and you offer me this one as well. That was, that was, of course, uh, uh, it's a way which we can do. Uh, and and uh, um, uh, mostly, of course, when we go home, I have a cup of tea, say, my religion, my your, yours is. I think yours. it's the love and respect as That's thing. right. It's respect is the most, the most important thing is, as, as uh, the sister uh, said, tolerance is goes respect is in the holy holy book, they should come in respect. Your religion is yours, my religion is mine. Peace. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're, I'm going to give Michael the last kind of. I don't want to. You don't want no, to. No, only that those two need to be careful. <laughs> well, <laughs> they are, that they, they're, 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 clearly, they're clearly discovering something more important than their religion. God The main thing is we are brother. We always been together for many of the brother. But I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to need to move things on, not yes, to shut that down, but because. Um, <laughs> Must have been late in our finishing because our kitchen here oh. is adapting itself to the potentially larger numbers uh, than expected and will doesn't therefore want to be late in our finishing. So we need to, you know, honor and respect that too. So I'm going to ask now that we shift into our final gear. And this is in response precisely to uh, Jackie. Uh, Tabik's uh, presentations on Jews and dialogue. And uh, we're starting with uh, Saria's response to that. And I'm just going to also need to excuse myself for a couple of minutes, as agreed with Anthony, who will steer things um, for the next few minutes. But I hope to be back very soon. He's a photographer. Okay, so when you're ready. Of justice, and again, 
the idea of justice is, you know, underpins these these power hierarchies, these negotiations uh, around values that we have been discussing all along. Having, you know, reread your conclusion, you are not going to go back to the start of your paper. Now you start with. I, you know, sociologically as the everyday um, aspects of interfaith dialogue. And you give us this example uh, of a Muslim family who, you know, after having a baby, you know, the wife has had many miscarriages. She stayed nearby to your synagogue and has heard from music. And she says, oh, that if the baby is alive, she'd come back. Muhammad. And I, I think that's a beautiful example. It's, it's very ordinary. But to me, it really talks about one of those, you know, few meaningful connections. I, I remember encountering a young um, Shia lad who was, you know, studying uh, Islamic studies institution. And he reflects, he says, one reason, you know, and this, and you know, coming back to that idea of understanding one's own faith, the significance of one's own faith, he says, my faith, and, and the Shia version of my faith, but also having had the opportunity to delve into Sunni aspects of faith and Sunni understandings and look at how history is complicated and messy. And you know, it's not that the Sunnis were all good or the Shias were all bad or vice versa. He said, after uh, having understood his faith at quite a deep you know, level through his Islamic. He decided that if he'd have children, then he'd have children. A little boy would be named Ali, which is you know quite common practice in Shia tradition. Ali is the archetype of Shia Muslim thought in many ways. But he'd name his daughter Aisha. Um, to me, that is really significant. Aisha was one of the youngest wife of the Prophet, but others. Um, she is. She's not. How to put it mildly? She's not very well accepted. In Shia thought, she is on occasion she may be vilified. Now, this through acqu acquisition of knowledge, this young man was going to change something that was quite mundane in his everyday life. On one level, you know, I'm going to have a boy and a girl. This is what I'm going to name them. How significant is it? I think it is much more significant than we give it value, you know, and including you know, your couple, your Muslim couple, who actually sought to step into a synagogue. There's a lot of bravery in that. There'd be a lot of questioning that they'd face from their community. I do hope, and we wouldn't know that because we don't know the end of that story. I do hope that there is you know, more to it. There was something else with that story that, that really moved me. And that was the, you know, they, they were attracted, they heard the music. Um, and often in a dialogue, we either emphasize our personal you know, positionalities or we emphasize our text. I think there is a lot of potential to look at art and artistic creation um, in the context of interfaith dialogue. You know, most you know people are moved by pieces of Islamic architecture. You know, there's populist far-right group. No, Islamic architecture. That's fine. The, the geometric shapes are beautiful. I don't mind having it here and there and the other. Um, and I think the, the potential of the artistic, be it music, be it um, you know, sculpture, be it you know, <coughs> any other form of art, singing. So there, there is a, I, there is a, we have a student in our apartment who's psychology. So nobody understands what she does. So she's got like huge questionnaires, but they were very much looking at the, you know, she was looking at the potential of sacred music to move um, the believer. She was looking at Christian music, Christian believers. Her findings are a bit mixed, but I think there is potential there to explore further. Can we facilitate enhanced dialogue by moving away from what is rigid, what is dogmatic, to what is perhaps more interpretable um, and more accessible? Very much indeed for you know, bringing yourself into your paper. You spoke about being the only Jewish girl of 93 in your year. You loved your head teacher, but when she retired, a number of Jewish girls jumped. I mean, there are these kind of you know experiences, experiences of experiences of 
you know, that can range, you know, from colleagues when I was working in investment banking wondered, you know, how I could speak English so well, despite being, you know, a Muslim woman. My prejudice that they had loved all, loved all of mine, and we had lovely discussions, existential discussions, Said the word existential is being used more. Somebody said it. <laughs> um, existential <laughs> discussions about you know the nature of, of faith. But you know, there are these mild acts of really have to wear it. Does it really so mild prejudice through you know quite horrific things that happen in society based on, on, on religious differences? And we went out and we did all that research work around religion, <coughs> discrimination, and equality. What the members of the public said to us, you know, we asked them, right? We've mapped all this diversity in Britain, religious and diversity. We've seen that there are ex significant experiences of unfair treatment, but there are also examples of resilience of communities working together. How can we resolve these situations? You know, how can we make it even better? And they said to us quite clearly, we don't want more but we want more spaces you know, for dialogue. Dialogue that is, you know, some of it that is top down, interfaith events, some of it that is more grassroots, the cup of tea or the plate of samosas. Um, and people really want to the, the different others. So thank you very much for you know sharing your own experiences. You know, the fact that and to be wary of you know, being drawn into debates, being converted either to Christianity or to, to Islam. That's the Muslim. Um, these are the, to me, the evangelical exercise, the evangelical capitalization project is very different from the interfaith dialogue, interconvictional dialogue project. Um, and I think your examples bring that to four. Um, I've got two minutes, so the last thing, there were lots of other things I wanted to talk about, but I think the last thing I will mention is diversity, you know, within the tradition. You know, you talk of yourself as a progressive Jew, and other Jewish communities might have very different dialogue. Um, and you talk about healing our own communities that might sometimes, you know, not really be seen eye to eye with each other. And certainly within the Muslim community, there are debates and discourses that are drawn around you know, traditional lines, Sunni and Shia tensions, political tensions, for example, um, or the Bandi Bareilly traditions in this country, the Bandi and Bareilly being two Islamic traditions that, that emerge from the Indian subcontinent. History provides us with a little bit of a balm that we can use to ease some of these tensions. Certainly, if you look at Sunni Shia's tensions, these, I won't say they were non existent, but they were much calmer um, than we see them today, you know, the, before the 19th century. And Shia theological scholars were very well regarded in Muslim communities studying with each other. And perhaps we look at some of this contextual stuff interfaith debates, because yeah, you're right, interfaith debates need to be addressed before we move. We need to be addressed in tandem with the, the interfaith debates. And finally, I, I, I hope John, I, you, know, you, met, you cited Jonathan Sachs, and sadly he had to you know, change his sentence. But, but I think we, I, I'll end my bit by you know, re-saying what he said, and, and you, know, you cited him. God has spoken to mankind in many languages, through Judaism to the Jews, to Islam to Muslims, God is all humanity, but no single faith is or should be the faith of all humanity. So thank you very much for your faith. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And we now turn to Jeremy and I hand it to all the gentlemen. Yes. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so, uh, given that we're not only talking about a dialogue, but we're also actually doing it right now, um, I found your talk particularly informative in, in terms of the history and the theology. Uh, it's testament to my ignorance that I didn't, also didn't know about the Noahide 
laws. And despite the fact that my father was Jewish and my mother converted to liberal Judaism from Anglicanism. Well, we should investigate more about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the strongest point that came over was the whole approach to dialogue from a Jewish perspective, even a progressive Jewish perspective, is deeply affected by you know, at least 2,000 year history of being a minority faith. And it was interesting that Jackie considers the dimmy status accorded to Jews in Muslim countries, although effectively making them second class citizens, as preferable to the discrimination and persecution often suffered in Christian countries. Um, and the fact that your, your example of uh, that you were at school in England and it looked like and the head teacher, as, uh, as sorry, I said, was applying covert co coexistence to um, his children is just shocking. Um, the paper rightly argues the need, the need for dialogue, though notably, I can't help noticing it didn't talk, it only talks about dialogue between the religions, which cuts out, of course, half the British population. But, um, but it also highlights the many different levels, and you talked about the have a cup of variety, which can also morph into something and you see the, the main purpose demonstrating that we Jews don't have horns or tails. And I see that's a really important thing, given the anti-Semitism that exists and has actually sadly got worse, I think, in this country. In fact, the British Jews, for centuries, the only non-Christian religious group in the country of any size, now find themselves eclipsed by others, mostly the Muslim population, which is over 10 times larger. So I suppose that's the reason why the broad range of <coughs> social cohesion is therefore more implicit rather than explicit objects. I, I like the definition of dialogue you had opening the conversation um, and if, uh, helping people to revise any prejudices and so on. But then I was surprised by the danger which we talked about before during the day that you said, if I engage in such a dialogue, and truly open to what I am told, and then afterwards assert the equal religious validity of the other person's past to God, then how can I say to Jewish people that I teach, especially the young, that Judaism is the way they should go? And that's apparently, from what you said, a concern that puts many Jews off. I found that really surprising. I guess it reflects the underlying issue of conversion and the history of being a small, embattled, non proselytizing faith swimming in a sea of Christian evangelism. Uh, and it was pretty astonishing to hear the stories you told of the Baptist minister at a Holocaust memorial event, for goodness sake, telling the congregation they should all convert to Christianity. And the deacon from Guildford Cathedral, who was supposed to be responsible for interfaith dialogue, saying as a modern woman that you should forget religious differences and worship Jesus. Those, and, you know, to me, the golden rule for dialogue, as opposed to debate, is no one is really should be there to convince the other to forego their faith. And I think that's a, a key thing. You can put your, you can argue about points, but you're not trying to convince somebody to forego their faith. To me, that's a golden rule, of uh, and it's about respect. Um, so those people, I think, should be treated with the disdain which they deserve. Um, but it's a shame if that perceived proselytizing environment creates a fear of even seeking to un fear of even seeking to understand the other's perspective through dialogue, through fear of contamination. And, and I was surprised to read the assumption that if somebody engages in dialogue and is truly open, that that implies that afterwards they should assert the equal religious validity of the other person's path to God. And that in turn makes it difficult to say to Jewish people that Judaism is the way to go. Perhaps I, I'm conscious of the fact that it's presumptuous of a non-religious person to stray into this territory here. Um, uh, so, but I don't quite understand the concern. Uh, in there's a book by uh, Alan, Dr. Alan Race, who I guess you may know, uh, chair of the World Congress of Faith, uh, making it's called Making Sense of Religious Pluralism. And what he does is identify three positions that Christians, and by extension, people of other faiths, may adopt as they engage in dialogue. And the three are exclusivist repudiation, which is there's only one truth, I'm right, the others are wrong. Inclusivist toleration, my tradition is closest to the truth, 
while others may have a glimpsing of God, it can only be measured in Christian conceptual framework, or the pluralist essence, which is that any religion with brutality and form, transformative power has reality, but it's only a partial view. And he uses uh, analogy of the famous analogy of the blind people encountering the elephant, and one mm -hmm. thinks of the and what it is, and somebody finds a trunk. That's our description. But none are able to understand the whole. Now, of course, the humans will say it's not a problem because it's an elephant. But, <laughs> uh, well, is that the <laughs> yes, it is. It's not even the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Certainly but, not the agnostic. Yeah, no, it's, 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 <laughs> in this view, <laughs> but, uh, main point, in, in this, those, even those who adopt this pluralist acceptance position, which I think is, is what papers assume, discussing the concern about dialect don't abandon the truth claims of their faith and ignore the associated cultural family ethnic identities which are of such importance to most Jewish people, often of more important theology as you, as you said. So from the outside it doesn't seem that this concern about dialogue contaminating parts of Jewish religion or faith is well placed, which isn't to deny the fact of their existence, if I take your word for it. I, in practice, I would have thought that the main threat to Jewish uh, community in the diaspora is not conversion at all, but assimilation into the essentially non-religious mainstream. Of course, I would uh, argue that that's okay, as everyone must be free to make their own decisions, including whether to remain in the faith of their parent, convert, adopt a non-religious worldview. Human rights, a freedom of religion, I believe, including change or leave of their faith isn't explored in the paper, nor actually in any. It is, of course, embedded in equality law, but it's been problematic for most faiths, especially in their more hardline versions, and for those who therefore decide to leave them. And I think I mentioned uh, uh, in my paper, Humans UK has this group called Faith to Faithless, started by two young ex-Muslims, but it also background who face challenges in leaving a coercive faith environment, including conservative Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, or ultra orthodox or Judaism. From that, it seems that diaspora Judaism has to navigate a difficult path between the desire to preserve the distinctive existence and culture of a people who survived through so many generations against all of the odds, and the need to respect individuals' rights of personal autonomy and choice in a largely non-religious and plural society. And I guess for some Jews, I would be an example of what can go wrong. Um, so, uh, countering this balanced view is the exclusivist theology of right wing Judaism, particularly in Israel, building up, as you said, on the most hardline interpretation of the problematic chosen people concept, um, an interpretation which seems to me like an open goal for anti Semites. In that respect, I thought the paper was really useful in explaining both the progressive interpretation of that term as a people chosen to receive and follow the Torah um, and the Roman period rabbinical view that uh, Adam, none can claim that their father is greater than another's father. I don't think there was an Adam. The principle of shared ancestry still holds good, and I think it's an important thing. The examples. Um, Given in the paper of recent declaration from Orthodox sources arguing for such equality and against teachings that promulgate hatred towards non Jews, and I guess we will think of the Palestinians here, um, indicate that the creative process, characteristics of all faiths, is continuing with, within Judaism. Another thing I learned was the Jewish spirituality exemplified by Rabbi David Zeller, and in particular, the view that the aim of spirituality is. And quote, the humbling of the self so that we can grow into an awareness of being part of a bigger pattern and then break through the limits we place upon ourselves and change the way we help or relate to each other. And that may be us, the universe, a part limited in time and place. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as separate from the rest. But this is a kind of mystical delusion of his consciousness. And the delusion is a kind of prison for us all, restricting us to our personal desire and the, the affection for those nearest to us. 
So he's saying exactly in a way, the same thing. Now, Einstein was ethnically Jewish, of course, but certainly not a religious man. Um, yet there does seem to be a lot of commonality between his view, Zealots, and that of many Buddhists. Um, Buddhists tend to avoid the term spirituality because of its religious and supernatural concepts of the connotations. Personally, I, I'm a bit cautious about it. But perhaps surprisingly, this sense of connectedness and transcendence, which I would say is a wonderful manifestation of the process of our human brains, is potentially an area of common ground which we don't really often explore. Anyway, I really welcome Jackie's call for people to leave the trenches, engage constructively with each other. With each other. It must be the right thing in society, so just to say, I'd like to include those of us who Thank you. Thank you. That's a really interesting and um, potentially to carry on to the end of our discussions at the end of the day. Michael, your, okay, your well, I've to... just learned how sensible Jeremy is in writing it down. Uh, <laughs> yeah. was, I'm past being coherent if I've been coherent before. Um, the only thing I've learned this afternoon is that dialogue of any kind should not go on for longer than two hours. <laughs> <laughs> However, I had um, eight points. Um, <laughs> 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 and since two or three have been adequately dealt with, ah. I will not expound on them. So there is hope. Um, but I mean, this isn't the first point, so just wait for it. But I mean, I think overall, I see your papers, if I may say so, sort of complementary to mine. Um, you are much more focused on what I would call recognizable interfaith dialogue. And I was much more focused on the context within which I think dialogue best takes place and may, if, if it's relevant, be fruitful. You know, I was contextualizing. Now, I know there are issues of contextualizing, me, but they're complementary. So, so I think we just acknowledge that, and that's really helpful. Okay. Round about page one and following, you... Um, about one type of dialogue, which I think it was you who called cup of tea, wasn't it? <laughs> and just to say, first of all, I recognize it, and I recognize the Baptist minister in it, okay? And that's one reason why this Baptist minister goes to the Angus. <laughs> <laughs> um, what you, di you didn't really go on in the paper there to say what you thought the other forms of dialogue were. Because I, I rather looked at it carefully to see what she's going to say about the others, and I didn't really find it. So it would be helpful if you could do a bit more in that. Okay. Um, my second point we've now dealt with, and that was this discussion about surely dialogue has got to have an element of persuasion in it, and how we deal with that and the tension between it and proselytism and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's discussions on record. Um, Yes, I picked up, I think Jeremy's just picked up as well. You, you have this rather sad thing, you know, how can you say to your uh, young Jew or, you know, the boy you're talking to or girl, this is the way you should go. How can I say that if I'm being genuinely, you know, open to the kind of constructive um, nature of all faiths? Hmm? How can I sort of, at the end of the day, almost claim a superiority? Um, I, I think I wanted to comfort you in your sadness. Um, I don't think you would talk to them as if it was superior. <coughs> you might say, this, this is where at the time being you belong, you know, and, you, and this is the tradition you've been born into and about its values for them without saying at some point you may think otherwise. But I just don't think you'd say that, but I can see that you come up against a bit of a problem. How can I deny superiority and then start sounding superior? But most of us do that. You know, a lot of it's gone on this afternoon, so don't worry too much. Um, one question I really would like you to talk more about this is the fourth point. Um, you said that uh, in the dialogue, there is a divine element. And then you sort of substituted the word divine for a spiritual element. Now, I was interested if you mean the same thing or you mean something different, and what exactly do you mean by the divine element? 
Um, and I want to know whether we're into another human construct here that you think somehow in the sacred text or wherever it might be, there's a kind of more direct revelatory element, which you may believe that may be your conviction, but is still a conviction that's made up by human beings. Uh, so what is the divine element? Uh, Christians would have to answer the same question. Um, the next one, uh, it was a concern again about being converted, uh, proselytizing, gaining converts. Um, I, I just noted there that our discussions just seem to come to an end. And maybe um, having heard us rambling this afternoon, you'll go back and extend it a bit, but you seem, suddenly seem to stop about that issue. And so I was a bit hungry to hear more. Okay. Uh, number six, again, we've all learned about the Noachide. Is that the way you say it, Noachide? No. Well, we've all learned about that. At least the three of us have learned about that. So thank you very much. But just to underline, it leaves all these question-begging issues, you know, about general words that don't get us very far until we start uh, taking them to bits a bit. And, you know, the word idolatry, which, again, makes us regret that the that other world of religions, Hindu and so on, aren't here to talk about it. Um, and you can say idolatry is worshipping the wrong things, or you can say idolatry is worshipping the right things too much. Um, but it needs exploring, doesn't it? Okay. And that's number six, so we're nearly there. Number seven, um, you have a problem about the chosen people. Okay. Um, First of all, don't have a problem that they felt they were chosen because they did, you know, and that's why they went on about it. Um, this is being fair to people's experiences, you know, they felt they were special. Um, and that still drives, as you know, um, some of the things that go on in Israel and Palestine today. Um, but just to come back to this famous Baptist Christian tradition, which now looms so large in these discussions, there was a well-known Baptist Old Testament scholar called H.H. H. Rowley, who wrote a book about this idea that the Jews were chosen. And the theme that ran through the book, I think, which is helpful to you, is they were chosen not for privilege, but for service. So they were called to do a job. They weren't called to be superior to everybody else. Last point. Um, he said, sorry, that sounds very adversarial, doesn't it? But here we go. Um, this phrase, we can have diversity without enmity. Right? Now, of course, in one sense, that's true. And in an ideal world, it would be more true if that's a possibility but it totally lacks realism. Uh, the fact is that in this world, and as long as this world goes on, says he with great conviction, you will not be able to have diversity without enmity. So you have got to balance all the enlightened goodwill approaches to dialogue and relationships with the very basic human reality that runs through Christian religion with the wrong vocabulary, but the right perception that we are both capable of behaving very well and we are capable and will behave very badly. So you cannot have idealistic pictures of how we're going to progress the dialogue and all understand one another better and accept our diversity without on the other hand saying, you need to address the issues of power, not just within the dialogue, but in the world at large. Because generally, we're still going to go on behaving badly, even when we might understand ourselves a bit better. So I speak to you out of the Christian realist social tradition on that particular point. Thank you. Any more? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So thank you to our uh, three panelists. And it's now Jackie's opportunity to respond to those Observations, comments, critiques, questions. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, um, I, I very much wonder what happened to that Muslim baby in the family. Um, I, I had another experience when I was about 18, 19, 
uh, my first visit to Israel, and it was in 60, um, 1968, uh, when going into the old city was not a big problem at all. And I was in the old city with uh, my cousin, who's now a doctor, and that's important for the story. Um, and uh, I heard a child cry. And if I hear a child cry, that's it. You know, I respond immediately. And so I looked around and there was this seven, eight year old who'd cut his leg and the blood was going pop like that, right? So I'm a, I was a guider. I took off my headscarf, I made a tourniquet and stuck it on the kid's leg, yes. And I couldn't communicate. I didn't know any Arabic and he didn't know any English or Hebrew. So we had a bit of a, you know, and he was yelling and yelling and yelling, which I didn't, I understood. And a hostile crowd surrounded me, yes? And, and somebody came and pulled my hand off and the blood went pop. So they put my hand back and they, you know, <laughs> the hostility went. And eventually someone came who spoke English and I managed to tell them the kid needs to go to hospital. And again, I just wonder, you know, what, what is the result of that? You know, just what, what is the result? I just hope that somewhere it, it, it had a positive outcome. That's I don't humanity. Know. Sorry? That's called humanity. Yeah. Well, that's what I that, 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 No, but that, that somebody of a different religion who was a tourist offer that help to a child they've never seen. And, and, and you know. We are, we are first human, and after that, we choose to be a religious. The first we are human, and after that, religion comes as a second. Well, to me, they are intertwined, but you know, yes. that's okay. But, you know, my cousin, who's now the doctor, couldn't do anything. She was going, ah! And I was doing the thing. That's the thing. Anyway, um, and I am fascinated by your notion of art and music and dialogue and architecture. Um, because one is aware that actually you need to touch the soul and the emotions, and one can do that so much more easily. So there are, in fact, often I've been part of evenings of dialogue which have taken place over music and art. And um, Judaism has more of a problem with that in that, you know, it wasn't until the 20th century that there were any really Jewish artists because of Questions about second commandment and not doing uh, making uh, pictures, um, but it is a beautiful way of doing that. Um, the uh, um, the other question is the um, personal experiences of prejudice and my lack. There was a terrible experience that uh, my husband and I had where we lived in Kenton. Uh, for many years, where there was a Muslim, uh, a Hindu family who just moved in down the road, and there was a very sad bereavement in their family. And there were people in the road, uh, and lots of people were coming to the household quite naturally, and there were some awful people in the road going around spraying perfume, yes, to make the smell of the immigrant go away. <laughs> so my husband and I decided we would go and visit the family. The trouble was we didn't know quite what to do or how to do it, but we decided we would go. Um, and it, it took quite a stand in the road um, that we did this. And I hope that that would develop resilience uh, amongst peoples. Um, the, uh, Jonathan Sachs, he has a, you know, his second book was not so good, but you know. <laughs> Um, I still respected him enormously. Um, he was very kind to me at various points in my career, um, and I, I always appreciated his, his humanity and his kindness. Um, despite the fact that we were on opposite sides of the fence, I still I second. Him. You second that, yes. He was a lovely man. Um, uh, the, uh, um, yes, we have had 2,000 years of being a minority faith. And that has led to certain feelings and prejudices and uh, worries within the Jewish community. Um, <coughs> absolutely. Um, the, uh, uh, 
I, I, and I apologize if in my talk, um, I didn't mention humanism enough. That not at all, I think I did. I apologize uh, because I was concerned with the notion of dialogue and faith and didn't give enough credence to humanism as a faith. Um, it, it, it's, uh, <coughs> if you acknowledge yourself, it's a, a, a difficult question. Yes, for your own the, the non religious, I'd yes. say, it should be the case, whether it's human. It was difficult. Um, the uh, anti Semitism has, is growing in this country. Mm -hmm. We are terribly aware of it. Um, our, our families are, are being influenced and being affected by it. Mm -hmm. And I would just implore anyone who is uh, of this group who are, you know, of, of the liberal kind in, in religion to be aware of this growth of anti-Semitism and respond to it um, because it is uh, mostly uh, political and misunderstood politics quite often. Um, and it is um, a very difficult situation, I think, uh, for many, many Jews. And that may uh, also uh, feed into our um, many people who do not wish to engage in dialogue because they see themselves being <coughs> still. Um, and you don't, actually, you don't make a good dialogue partner if you feel attacked. <laughs> You've got to feel strength and security in yourself uh, before you can do that. Uh, and I will read Alan's book. I haven't read that one. So I'll have a go at reading Alan Race's book. Um, uh, the business about human rights and freedom of religion as a, a major topic, which is something that you mentioned. One of the interesting things is it was many, many Jews who actually contributed to the uh, human rights declaration. Um, but within Judaism, we don't talk about human rights. We talk about human responsibilities. It's not my right for things. It's my responsibility to make sure that things happen which is a different emphasis um, and the one that I try and, and live by and teach. And um, try to, I can't read my notes here, it's terrible. Um, uh, and yes, David Zeller and Einstein, um, you know, in, in, in many ways, there is a basis of, um, of, of spirituality, I'll, I'll come back to the word in a minute, within the world. Um, and our, the founder of the World Congress of Faith was aware of that, having gone to the East. Um, you know, I believe very strongly in one God, and therefore um, there is one humanity, because that God created that one humanity, and therefore, um, you know, within many of the more mystical traditions of all religions, there is a great similarity. Um, so I know, uh, you know reading Sufi teachings, I'm aware very closely of some of the connections between us and Judaism, <clears throat> and similarly reading Christian um, mystical thought. Well, that's maybe more difficult because it centered more on Jesus and, and Mary. Um, but say still the idea of having um, the one God and the oneness of creation is very important to me, um, really important. And that's why I get involved with interfaith dialogue. Um, so um, there are other forms of dialogue, thank you. And I realize I messed them out in the middle of the talk and I'll try and put them in later. Um, so I just that you raised my hopes and then dashed them. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I thought I'd mentioned a couple, but not, not all, not enough, obviously. Um, I, I haven't thought of the bus stop one. I love the bus stop. I must remember that one. Um, then there is the T one, which is just, you know, this is this and this is that and then, yeah. Um, the uh, one that I really missed out was where we cooperate to do good things in the society. And that is, that, that does happen, of course, we, we all engage in that. And I missed that out. That is an important form of dialogue. Um, but I did think I'd mentioned the deeper form of dialogue when we mentioned, when we talk about our religious beliefs because that to me is the deepest form of dialogue, which you can only do with very few people. 
very small group. And usually at three o'clock in the morning is the best time to do it, if anyone want to engage in it. Uh, it's a really good time. Um, how I usually describe things to my um, to kids if I'm talking about that tension um, that I mentioned and you both uh, picked up is I talk about um, that life is a bit of like a wheel um, and that God is the center of the wheel and that where we are on the rim will give us our quickest path into that center. And that's the, the image I usually use, um, trying to, to make the difference between this. Um, and of course, you know, we cannot understand God. God is a soft, God is without end. Uh, and one of the uh, mystics of the medieval period talks about God being like a diamond with thousands of faces. And depending which where you are, you see different faces mm -hmm. of that God and have different understandings of that God. Um, uh, the, uh, what else, I can't think, the, the chosen people, I hoped I had understood, I, I had explained that to me being chosen means to have a job. You know, uh, we were chosen to keep God's commandments. That is what we are. But you're probably right. In the beginning, they thought they were chosen for other reasons too. Though even in the Torah, it says you are not chosen because you are, you know, a, a great people, particular people. You know, you're just chosen because God's idea. Son of Israel. They were son of Israel and chosen because of Israel. Yes, this is very important to you. And um, about the diversity without enmity. You know, what you said reminded me of that dreadful person who said we should all worship Jesus. You know, we're better off if we mm -hmm. all have the same religion. And I don't think you know, I'll cope with that. Um, diversity. Well, that would to be me. a gross misunderstanding of what I said. Oh, okay. Go on, help me. Well, because what you're painting is one's, you're painting a, a world. Kind of, I, of course, it's possible for certain people to be in relationships yeah. where they are different, but they're not in enmity. Of course, yes. that's possible. But what I'm saying is, if you think that in this world, that's what we can mostly have, you are not facing up to reality. I'm not saying we mostly have, I say we can work towards it. But, but although you work towards it, you still got to live with the equally enduring reality that most people, many people, and groups of people will not live with difference I, I without understand. enmity. I, so you've you got to attention. try and balance power in situations. You've got to get back to the issues of power. Okay. Um, it's one of the fundamental um, teachings of Judaism is that we all have to work towards the Messianic <coughs> future or the coming of the Messiah. Um, that is an optimistic view of the future. You mean you say it? Sorry? You mean Isaiah? You say Moshe, I say, I say Isa. Okay. That's, a, that's what, what we got. You're, okay. You're Moshe. Okay. Um, as a progressive Jew, I say messianic era rather than a person. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that is our uh, role, is to work towards that. And yes, I recognize that there is the Yetzirah, there is the inclination to do evil in all of us, and there is the inclination to do good in all of us. And it's up to each of us to try and fight that inclination to do evil and make sure that the inclination to do good survives. And yes, it may mean that we have to fight power. Uh, you're right. I mean, power politics are incredibly uh, important. Um, but my, my faith teaches me that eventually we will get to the messianic era if we all work towards it. That is my hope as my faith. But we'll this will will live with difference without enmity. Good. I thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, on that note. <laughs> thank you. And um, I mean, thank you again to all the speakers. Uh, as Michael points out, you know, we shouldn't have to attend to dialogue that goes over two hours. Even if Jackie was inviting us to come back at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> or on another day. Uh, and I understand. The point about those conversations in those times. Um, before we go into our kind of concluding wider discussion, I'm going to do the closing bit kind of now because at a certain point, um, a bell will sound loudly, which calls us 
to eat. And uh, so, so we stop at that point rather than interrupting the flow of a discussion. Um, so I just want, before we open up the wider discussion around um, response to Jackie's paper, to <coughs> first of all, acknowledge um, the organizers of the, of the whole program, uh, the Dialogue Society and the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture working collaboratively together. And for others who may have joined us since earlier in the program to say the papers that have been developed or presented first separately and now developed in the light of hearing each other and each other's questions and comments um, will be coming forward into a special edition of the Journal of Dialogue Studies coming out um, in the autumn. So thanks for that and thanks for everybody's participation in making that possible. Um, we have taxed ourselves, but I think there've been many points so far, and we still have 15, 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes, um, that have been really illuminating, really helpful, really challenging uh, to all of us at different levels, um, intellectually, emotionally, and even if we can use the word sometimes in humanist presence spiritually in some sense of that word um, in our, our common humanity and our perceptions of what's important in life. So thank you. So let's open up. Uh, thank you for Jackie's response to the overall responses. And we open up that conversation um, around that uh, in our final 20, 25 minutes or so. Uh, if you allow me to say one to you. But Jackie, I, I believe we have been together on the congressional. Uh, we've been together with Marcus. Yes, Marcus I, I recognize you very much. Yes, for some time. Yeah, yes. that, that's, that's a great yeah. course, Marcus. Yeah. Uh, I think he's a president. And yes, he's that's right. Very close to him. So one thing I would like to say here, nobody mentioned, they said dialogue, 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 and they're fighting with the dialogue and that and that. Dialogue is uh, exchanging information. Debate is a different thing, but you never know what he said about the debate here. Well, we did we actually before you arrived. Okay. So just debate. Debate. I never debate for forty years. I never do because you get nowhere. He said, um, "Anything you do better, I will do better than you." That's what, that's well. What actually, I mean. we say that did come up in the discussion. Oh, okay. And in fact, it also came up in Rabbi Jackie's original presentation, um, where you cited the example <coughs> of what used to occur in Spain historically, which was actually let's set up a debate to show how these Jews are wrong, yeah. as distinct from let's have a dialogue, mm -hmm. and that was very definitely yeah. the mode. So I think, you know, have actually. Sorry, also, sorry, that, 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 also that, raised it, the whole discussion about persuasion. Yes. Persuasion, yes. yes. yeah. Uh, they, they have, everybody has <clears throat> had the right to choose their religion. As I said, of course, you, can, you cannot choose yourself, you're a human or not. You are human. The second time, as I said, of course, you, you change your religion because you cannot change the humanity. Uh, but uh, it's very important, of course, I was going to talk to the <clears throat> sister, which she said between a Shia and a Shia, and of course, uh, 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 Sunni is at the moment you have a big feud uh, that that called Lady of the Heaven, which I've been several times uh, talking to the executive producer in the BBC that that that, that about it and, and then we, we give opinion. The, the, these are has to be uh, open and of course uh, another thing which we have with the Jackie. I Jackie, saw you on GB News. Yeah, oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. That, that's what GB News and the, uh, we, we are trying and we are trying to say the best. Let's see if one and a half thousand years of the wound has been healed and somebody come and open it. Why? Now, well, what is, of course, that, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a theological. Um, um, what I would like to say, Jackie, is a very important, very important, you mentioned, you mentioned that, <clears throat> you mentioned the anti-Semitism. I would think if you mention anti-Semitism beside of the Islamophobia, which is a huge at the moment, huge, if you get together, because both, both is the same, or less. We are, we are suffering the same. Great. If we get together, which I always, always, I said, I said, I'm talking to many, many times, of course, 
uh, working with uh, Rabbi Mervis, you know, that, 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 that Rabbi has been working together on the several issues, especially the Islamophobia and Semitism. We have to come together which eradicate that, otherwise we can't. Which is, a, oh, I want to do that, that means, um, you, you understand what I'm saying, is a problem of the community which we have to solve it, otherwise they're going to get rid of both of both. Important thing which you have to which you have to say, of course. Uh, uh, I shall, I, shall, I wrote a couple of more things which is may not be uh, important, but uh, because um, I was going to give the papers or whatever, whatever. But what I would like to say, I would like to ask ask the lady, uh, lady, what do you think of course they said at the moment is very calm. Uh, the, the the Shia and the Sunni is very calm. I'm trying to bring them all together, and I said, yeah, I'm sure. But what do you say at the moment in the in the, in the blasphemies which which the government says no? I want a freedom of expression. I say uh, not free, freedom of expression. Yes, but freedom of insult. No, we had we had many. Of uh, course, I'm still working with the government. We have 120 120,000 signature. But she said, stop it, they stop it because of the of the danger which you have, which the Shia cleric may. Because of the, they say Fatima has been injured. Fatima, Fatima was a daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon. Has been injured, and some Shia cleric uh, extremist suddenly says, "You touch my lady, I touch yours." And the little woman going to test one day, whatever. This can happen for that reason. I said I stop it. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, of course, freedom of speech. However, the, the, I, I believe that the. the uh, the um, producer wants to get a lot of uh, attention. They take it here and take it there. Therefore, what do you think? Do you think is it still is still calm, or or you think uh, uh, something is happening there? I think dialogue. I said it used to be calm, it's probably oh, the entire to... the twentieth century when you know. So in Antanita, the 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 primary the, the, the archetypical. The Sunni cleric founder of the Hanafi school of thought study, which she was scholars and vice versa. So, a long, long time ago, Sunni Shia dialogue, Sunni Shia tension weren't as much at the forefront as they are today. <coughs> fast forward to, you know, maybe fast forward to the Iranian consolidation of opposing identities. Um, Fast, you know, fast forward to shooting down of innocent, you know, Sunnis and Shia shooting down each other in mosques in the Indian subcontinent, hardening of you know, these two identity positions. So that are then translated into the debates that we have. Um, and all I will say is, if you look at historical context, you say let's try and learn a little bit from history and, and look at the common. Freedom of expression and 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 should be important. But nowadays, you do sometimes see it then erring into the freedom to to offend. And I think there's a thin <coughs> line there between freedom of expression yeah. and the freedom to offend. Yes. Uh, of course, the, the main yeah. thing was freedom of expression. The main thing was what you know, my argument was was it when the Charlie Hebdo came at that time. Of course, I was talking to Charlie. Charlie Hebdo was the France show it many killing was the the uh, the, the Belgium show it the many killing an argument that uh, the three hundred people got uh, killed in India, Afghanistan, and everywhere else. But what the UK done, which is the top, uh, I believe, one hundred percent with my heart is a top democratic country in the world. There is nothing, nothing to it. I you understand? But what they done, they did not show. They did not show. I was in television radio, everybody said, be quiet, but they wanted my opinion. But they did not show and nothing happened. And it was amazing because they chose the wisdom. You understand? They were so white, I can't remember who was there, who was there in front of me. Um, but, you know, that's a long debate. We could be yes, here for the rest yes, of the day. Idea of diversity without energy. Um, I was thinking about, you know, in Palestine, all of the issues. You know, it's the elephant in the room. You can't have, well, you can have Muslim Jewish dialogue. 
as long as you acknowledge that elephant and, and either say, right, we're not going to do that, engage in, 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 in sort of sensible you know, reactions to all of this. However, there is one place, and this is a little bit tongue in cheek, where Muslims and, and Jews really get on a whole idea of ceremonial slaughtering of meat. And so I remember in the middle of Facebook, then somewhere, and, and the Jew, Jewish gentleman says, I don't really get on with the Muslims. And you know, they wanted to build a mosque where we wanted to build synagogues, arguments. And then the region had decided to hold a review. On, on how meat is slaughtered, and apparently they then became best friends. And, and again, you know, so there is diversity. There's actually, you know, there is quite, you know, angry with each other on an issue of theological significance to both. And some circumcision. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> circumcision is the other. We were like those two. Exactly. And so we make more of what we learn. What we learn from those episodes when we get on well with each other. Uh, I just, because um, you've raised the, mm. the freedom of speech, I think you know mm. it is worth putting on the. You should defend freedom of speech. No one, there's not a law that says you can't be offended. Mm -hmm. There is no law for that. There is no blasphemy in the country. And the reason why. Newspapers didn't show the Charlie Hebdo thing, which I agree with, grossly offensive, um, because people because of fear of violence. Now, because of violence, and the reason why the government is well, scared, can, can you're kind just, of scared of us. No, no. Uh, newspaper editors about looking after their stuff. Now, and what I find so worrying is we have effectively a de facto the blasphemy law being enacted through fear of violence. Now, you know, we cannot have that. We cannot have that. That's, you know, our society doesn't, doesn't work on that basis. If, right, I would defend the rights of people to protest very strongly and march and argue with, with television producers whatever they want to do, because that's freedom of speech. But so is the freedom to show a film. The show is a freedom to publish a, a cartoon. We cannot have one by determining I, what happens in public life. I agree with you actually completely in relation to the violence, and I think there's, there's a lot of debate within the Muslim community around you know, engaging with civil society, engaging with different contexts, um, and using you know, peaceful protests, using um, intellectual uh, challenge to these concepts to, to defend uh -huh. the, the, the honor of um, religion. I mean, these figures are deeply uh, important within the Muslim context. And, and what makes them important, the engagement yeah. that is by the society, that perhaps is a better challenge yes, rather than yeah. violence. If you allow me to say, I, I mentioned it and I mentioned it again, I said, I said, I don't know who was the prime minister, but what a wise. I said, wise did it. So I said, fear? Fear, this government has no fear. Has no fear at all. I work with the government very close with the lords and, and the parliament. I give advice, but uh, especially in Ukraine as well. But uh, uh, I have got, they have no fear. There is no fear. And they protect, I said, the highest democratic in the, in, in the world. I said, I said five minutes ago, and of course, our, our, our friend says the fear. There is no fear. There was the element of the wisdom. He was showing the government element of wisdom and, and, the, and the everybody because it is their subject. He loves all of them. Doesn't matter if he's a Muslim, Christian, and that, that, that. He said, we keep it quiet. We haven't got the blasphemy law. We have a cancellation law. Now, the cancellation is what the government done, what they got, 120,000 we got it, and they canceled it completely, and they got less than more. I mean, if, if I might be allowed to put it in a word of my own, it's, it's um, as somebody who wrote, for example, uh, a book, A Mirror for Our Times, which reflected on the satanic verses yes. controversy. Um, at that time, of course, there was a blasphemy law, yes. and it was a law yes. that only uh, protected yeah. whether Christians wanted it, yeah. one religious group. So there was a manifest inequality and injustice in that position. Yeah. And then the argument was, 
should there be such or should it be extended? And the argument as it was developed in civil society was not to extend it to embrace all religions, which might have been one pathway, but rather not to have a blasphemy law that was to do with um, offences, well, ultimately towards God and not offences towards human believers' feelings, but rather to develop a line of law which was to do with incitement <coughs> and that incitement to religious hatred or to other forms of hatred. And legal, I think there's a lot of wisdom <coughs> in the legal civil society position that rested on that understanding. Of course, that does not solve everything because when is legitimate and powerful and street protests and sometimes very strongly articulated views, when does that become or become perceived either by people working in artistic industries or by simply a person who opens the door on a cinema and locks up at night or by the government or by different groups, when does that become perceived as being yeah. incitement? Yeah. So it's not a get out clause, it remains a very difficult set of issues. But I think, and still strongly argue, uh, I argued in, in, in my book 10, 15 years ago on this, that that is the wisest way in a civil society yeah. of many faiths and norms um, that we've done. Yeah. Yeah. However, the point is that there may be other things also that we wish to pick up on, um, giving opportunity to anybody on the screen not forgetting their presence. Yes, yeah, so Matt has a hand raised. Matt. <coughs> yeah, this, this is a fascinating discussion. I, I, I've had it. I've had it recently in some exam papers. Um, that my students have marked, and they were talking about the issue of Charlie Hebdo and incitement. And, I, and the line I, I gave to my students, incitement almost in, in that legal sense requires three parties. It requires the party uh, A to incite party B to do something against party C in that sense. So one could say absolutely that you could say that um, the journalists, the, satirists, uh, the satirists at Charlie Hebdo what they were doing was foolish, you might say, what they were doing was um, uh, incendiary, what they were doing was um, um, sacrilegious, what you, you could definitely say that, all those things, absolutely. Please be quiet, I'm on the, my kids are in the background, sorry, it's, 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 it's the morning here, they're doing homeschool in California. <laughs> I'm trying to make this point. Daddy, I'm trying to make this point. Um, but what I don't think what logically follows is you can say that the satirists and journalists of Charlie Hebdo incited murder or violence on themselves. It, it took, it took, it took, it took a party A to incite a party B, and the party B were the actual activists who did the the wicked, godless uh, killing, the murder of a third party. So it required someone to incite, someone to act on on someone else. Now, leaving aside the rights and wrongs of it, and I think obviously the the murder is disgraceful. I um, and I would have said that the it was unwise for the the um the gent for Charlie Hebdo to do what they did. But I think under French law, there was, there, you know, as you know, in French law, there, there was, you know, there was no prohibition of doing it. But it's not, it, we can't say, and I'll shut up once I finish this point, we can't say that the journalists incited murder on themselves. We, we can't, doesn't follow. Yes. yes. Well, of course, if he did not do it, unfortunately, he didn't incite somebody else to do it because that, but even he did not, uh, I say, Charlie, I always say, Charlie Hebdo did not deserve to die, did not at all, or, not, or, or anyone else's in the world, because it did not. If the Prophet, peace be upon him, I said in television, really, if the Prophet, peace be upon him, was here, he said, forget about it. We love it. You believe me, I did not. He says, forget about it. We believe he was so kind because 
they said he was he was he was comforted. Bama asabaki illa rahmatan al alamin. The Almighty God says, "O messenger, O prophet, O Muhammad, we did not send you except uh, to be uh, to be a, a, a mercy to the mankind. Mankind, not a Muslim, not a that. That's what he says in the book of Surah al -Anbiya. Therefore, what we need, he was that that beautiful man, and of course, uh, uh, however, however, this. Uh, these things happen, and uh, I was very proud of uh, our country, which basically he did not, he, he done very wise, and I take away that. Okay. I think that's a key so, point for our discussion here about mm -hmm. what we're trying to achieve in dialogue mm -hmm. is that much greater breadth and depth of understanding <coughs> in order to actually overcome these issues in society. Mm -hmm. I mean, a good topic about it would be to understand for outside of what is so offensive about the Lady of Heaven. You know, I don't know. No. <laughs> I mean, it is, and indeed, in the common in the common room before this started, we did discuss a little bit mm -hmm. something because it's also the government's response in terms of Muslim advisors. You know, there are issues around that. Oh, and one of one, you know, take this it's yeah. very delicate and complicated situation, um, and I'm not sort of wanting to close yeah. down this stuff. Um, yeah. conversation of a dinner. <laughs> yes, yes, you're very, everyone, well, yes, so Anthony, please, maybe, everyone maybe is... you can conclude our, oh, uh, as, <laughs> as our director uh, of the OCRC. Right. Is, we'll have is it possible to get a picture? I don't know, you are allowed to, not allowed to, but what, what's happening? Yes, so we can come get a picture outside, yeah, oh, I think we can kind of try to a close now. Uh, the bell will go in about five or ten minutes. Um, we will be encouraged to line up. Um, they don't want us to come too late because all the undergraduate students will come there first. And quite a few of you are vegetarian, and they'll probably nab all that first before we get there. So, um, <laughs> that's good. Well, indeed, yeah. But first, let me just say a big thank you to Paul. Paul's done a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, I think we will say that there's probably be an overabundance of leeches today. It's been good, but I think some of us have flagged a little bit. But even so, even so, I think it's given us ample opportunity to tease out what have been many questions that have been raised really from the previous four excellent presentations. Mm -hmm. um, all of them have been different, and yet there's been a, a high degree of unanimity, but without a sort of commenting. Uh, but without a sort of lowest common denominator kind of leveling down, um, where, which sometimes happens, I think, in terms of dialogue. So, in order to keep the peace and to be very, very fraternal, that's it. We have not done that. And I think it's going to be to the credit of all four speakers and to the gracious way in which we've all engaged with one another. Secondly, I'd like to say thank you to the Dialogue Society for your input. Uh, I mean, our numbers have been extraordinary. You know, I mean, uh, since I started here, we have rarely had 25 people sat around the table eating a meal at the end. Um, and it's been our joy really to offer such hospitality. I think when this college was first thought of and founded, I'm not sure that the architects of the college thought that one day there would be so many Muslims in the participation. I hope that they would see this as a good thing. <laughs> I think about the Baptist dissenting tradition, that at its best has been one that's fought for the rights of all people. Mm -hmm. So just as I think non-conformist Christians have been in the past marginalized against the backdrop of African supremacy, such an African sense in the middle of it. I think at, the, at its best, what Baptists have done is not just to fight for their own rights, but to fight for the rights of all those who have been denied a voice. And so I think this gathering is very much quintessential, I would believe, as being part of the Baptist tradition since Hebrew, 
is not really a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> my grandparents were Baptists, so sort was of my mother. Um, and, and finally, I, to, finally, I think um, to say, well, for nothing very quickly, say thank you to our four speakers. You have all been magnificent. <laughs>